This is a symposium that really started in thought about a year ago here at the Academy meeting when the International Psoriasis Council and the International Eczema Council got together. Uh, we share so much and thought about putting on a joint symposium. We decided to have a symposium that addressed the question of whether atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two diseases or on the same spectrum. And we put together a program at the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology in the fall that was so wildly successful that we were encouraged to put on a similar program here uh, at the Academy in the United States. So our question today will be whether these are two diseases or on a spectrum, and that's something you should be thinking about as you hear our presenter to pre presenters today. I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about our two organizations. You may not be very familiar with them, and then you can see why we've come together to do this symposium. The International Psoriasis Council was founded in 2004. It has more than 100 board members and counselors from 29 countries. It is a dermatology-led, voluntary, global, nonprofit organization that's dedicated to innovation across the full spectrum of psoriasis, and its mission is to advance the care of people with psoriasis worldwide through education, research, and advocacy. And advocacy. Its goals are to expand the influence with individual healthcare practitioners around the globe through educational symposia, web-based resources, and preceptorships, to elevate the standard of care for those living with psoriasis with a focus on personalized outcomes. And this is being done through the development and dissemination of evidence-based treatment standards through working groups, roundtables, and consensus conferences and also to facilitate the exchange of ideas around basic and clinical research and support collaboration between researchers around the globe. And particularly high on its list right now is the Global Psoriasis Atlas, which is identifying and prioritizing gaps in psoriasis research. And the IPC wishes to thank its many corporate members who are listed here. Now, the International Eczema Council was founded in the very end of 2014, and frankly, it was modeled precisely after the International Psoriasis Council. It is now a 12-person board of directors with 77 counselors and associates from 21 countries around the globe, and it is growing. As with the Psoriasis Council, it is dermatology-led, voluntary, a global nonprofit organization led by dermatology experts, but on atopic dermatitis, and similarly focused on moving forward new developments related to research and bringing innovative new therapies to patients. And it brings together experts to identify and prioritize unmet needs in atopic dermatitis research, to facilitate atopic dermatitis research that addresses these needs, to disseminate evidence-based information about atopic dermatitis and its optimal management to healthcare professionals and to the public, through presenting educational symposia, providing web-based resources, preparing white papers, guidelines, and standardized assessments through working groups, roundtables, and consensus conferences, ultimately to promote good practices in the care of patients with atopic dermatitis worldwide, and importantly, to collaborate with physicians, scientists, and stakeholder organizations worldwide toward fulfilling the IEC's goals. So today's symposium is really based on these principles of disseminating evidence-based information, promoting good practices in care, and the collaboration that's so important to both groups. And the IEC would like to thank its corporate members who are listed here. Now today's presentation uh, had some additional sponsorships, and we want to thank educational grants from Celgene, Leo Pharma, and Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals to support this program. Now, our goals today are to dissect the overlap and differences in the underlying basis for atopic dermatitis and psoriasis, to review new, more targeted therapies, and determine if there is overlap in their use, to recognize the need to better subclassify atopic dermatitis and psoriasis based on underlying immunophenotype, and ultimately to assess if psoriasis and atopic dermatitis are part of a spectrum or are truly different disorders. Uh, I will serve as chair today with 
uh, president-elect of the IEC, and that's Emma Gutman, as well as Alexa Kimball, who is president of the IPC. Other faculty will be introduced separately, but will include Jonathan Silverberg, Junko Takesh Takeshita, and Bocock, Wilson Lau, Frank Nestle, Eric Simpson, Joel Gelfan, Thomas Bieber, and Kelly Cordoro. So a, certainly a star crew who will be presenting for us today. And as you can see at your chair and, and here, uh, we have a program agenda that will take us through the epidemiology and natural history, the genetics, immune pathway, comorbidities, therapy, and then bringing it together with what's happening in pediatrics. So without further ado, let me call up our first dynamic duo of speakers, and all our speakers today will be up here together talking about atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. So if uh, Dr. Silverberg and Takashita could come up, please. I'll introduce both of you. So uh, Dr. Silverberg is an assistant professor of dermatology, medical social sciences, and preventive medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. He's also the founder and director of Northwestern's multidisciplinary eczema center, and as everyone knows, a highly prolific author about atopic dermatitis and particularly about uh, the epidemiology related to it. For psoriasis, I'm happy to introduce Junko Takashita, who is an assistant professor of dermatology and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania, where her clinical focus and her research focus is on psoriasis. Good morning. Okay, it's nice to see such a nice turnout for uh, atopic dermatitis and for psoriasis, of course. <laughs> forget about psoriasis. <laughs> well, you know, for so long, the conversation's been about psoriasis alone, and, and it's always going to be a hot one and an important one. But to see atopic dermatitis get its day and, and really, um, you know, that visibility uh, and attention is uh, very gratifying. So uh, these are our disclosures. Most of these are not really relevant to anything being discussed today. Uh, so we'll start off with the basics of incidence, prevalence, and natural history. And we'll do a little bit of a back and forth, um, which hopefully no one will get dizzy. Um, but just talking about, first we'll start with atopic dermatitis. There's a lot of things we know in terms of the basic epidemiology, and there are a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, when you look at the incidence globally, um, some recent studies have put it um, at around two, over 2,000 to 3,000 um, children per 100,000 person years. So uh, fairly high incidence. Um, in Germany, back in 1997, uh, data showed as high as 17,000 per uh, 100,000 person years. When you look at sort of the children or adults, right, because most of the work's really been done in the pediatric cohorts, um, but when we're looking at adults, we have even less data. And uh, in Japan, as high as about 10,000 per 100 person years, and this is for adults and children combined. In the UK, um, going back to 2005, over 13,000 per 100,000 person years. What we're lacking actually in the U.S. is we don't have any great incidence data. We have some prevalence data, which I'm about to show you, but we don't really have any incidence data to know just how commonly these disorders uh, be, or atopic dermatitis be, comes about. When you look at the prevalence, uh, so I'll walk you through this panel here first. Um, this is just, these bar charts really highlight some of the differences between different assessment approaches and different study designs and some of the different numbers that have come up. Um, when you look in children, um, probably the, one of the best studies to look at for this uh, exercise is the National Survey of Children's Health. It's a nationwide um, household survey, randomly sampled, somewhere between 90 to 100,000 plus households, and estimated prevalence from the 2003 to 2004 National Survey of Children's Health was about 10.7 percent of all children. But when you look at 2007 to 2008, the actual number bumps up to about 12.98. Um, Different study design, National Health Interview Survey, which is an in-person household survey, slightly different methodology. For some reason, always very similar question, but somehow always underestimates that prevalence compared to National Survey of Children's Health. Um, when you stratify, because we have many years of rich data to look at, to look at trends, uh, you see that in 1997 to 1999, a prevalence of about 7.4 percent. When you fast forward to 2009 to 2011, you're up at about 12.5 percent. So both of these studies really showing um, that there's an increasing prevalence over time. In adults, I think this is an area that is a little controversial because, so 
you know, I'm showing you numbers that, that I actually published, and it's something that, it turns out atopic dermatitis is a very hard disease to assess from an epidemiologic standpoint for a number of different issues. Um, but looking at the 2010 National Health Interview Survey, which used a less specific question, the prevalence was estimated at around 10 percent. When looking at the 2012 National Health Interview Survey, which is a more specific question, it's around 7 percent. And I think the number is probably closer to 7 percent, but the 7 percent might underestimate a little, the 10 percent might overestimate a lot, so it's probably somewhere in that range. Well, what's interesting is, you know, we think of the United States as being sort of one country and everything's lumped together, but you're covering a major, you know, a broad spectrum in terms of land mass, geography, climate, environment, et cetera. And so there's a, a very broad distribution of prevalences and, and ranges. And so this is a heat map from, um, from the 2003-2004 National, National Survey of Children's Health, which was pu published by uh, Eric Simpson's group, and found that, so when you look at the, the blue states, those are the lowest prevalence states, the green are in the middle, and then you have the, the red states, which are the highest prevalence. So you see there are certain relative hotspots around the coast, and then there's this little hotspot right here. And, you know, this trend, generally speaking, holds up as well for 2007-2008 National Survey of Children's Health. We see that there clearly are, uh, you know, regional differences even within the United States. Um, interestingly enough, it's, a, it's almost a color invert uh, in some respects from the electoral map, but that's a separate issue. <laughs> um, so when looking at the prevalence, I showed you for the United States that the prevalence seems to be increasing from those data. But in fact, there, there's evidence now to show that really globally the prevalence has been increasing for quite some time and really even in recent years continues to increase in many countries. And so this was a very nice uh, systematic review uh, that looked at um, really any uh, locations where there were multiple studies that were published over time where there could be, really be an assessment of did the prevalence change or did the incidence change over time. <clears throat> and there are a number of countries that are highlighted here where in fact the prevalence did increase. So UK, Germany, Morocco, Kenya, China, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, etc. So it, you know, each country has to be approached sort of individually to understand those nuances and what drives the, the prevalence or incidence in the population. But this is something that whatever those risk factors are, they're, they're either increasing or something is changing, but the prevalence and the incidence are, seem to be increasing globally. Um, there, at least in the United States, appear to be some uh, racial and ethnic differences in terms of the prevalence. And so these are data from the 2007-2008 National Survey of Children's Health, which found that, you know, compared to uh, the uh, racial and ethnic background and breakdown um, nationwide, and this is a fairly uh, representative distribution for the non-atopic dermatitis children, but for those with atopic dermatitis, you actually have the highest rates in the African American children at about 22 percent, so more than double um, that, actually this, the way this is uh, broken down is the percentages are a little, I think one of them is a little off here, but um, the actual prevalence for of atopic dermatitis in uh, ca Caucasian children is about 10 percent, a little less than 10 percent. And in African-American children, it's almost 20 percent. So you have an almost doubling the rate percentage-wise. And these kinds of associations are highly reproducible um, from multiple studies. I mean, it almost doesn't matter where you look, you find these associations in children. But what's fascinating is you don't for adults, and it's totally unclear why not at this point. Um, some other reproducible associations uh, seems to be a higher prevalence in uh, older girls and in women. Um, there's an urban versus rural gradient where there clearly seems to be higher prevalences in metropolitan areas. And then um, there's some controversy about some of this and how it works, but higher household income and socioeconomic status in many areas has been shown to be associated as well with higher prevalences of atopic dermatitis. Um, in terms of the natural history, um, What's fascinating about this graph, so these are data from the National Health Interview Survey 2012. And what's beautiful about this study is they asked this question finally, not just in children, but also in adults. And <clears throat> you look at the prevalence of atopic dermatitis, and what you see is, not surprisingly, the prevalence peaks, you know, in early childhood. And it sort of dips down here. Around adolescence, there's a precipitous drop. And then it drops to around 7% in adulthood. This is that study that was the source of that 7% number I quoted beforehand. But when you watch it over time, it holds steady. So it really seems to be not just something that slowly peters out prevalence-wise over time, but really holds its own throughout the adult years. And, uh, you know, so the question is, 
And especially when you look at the two studies, you know, population-based studies in the U.S., showing much higher prevalences than anticipated. It seems to be robust and hold up throughout adulthood. Why? You know, why is this higher than we previously thought, or at least sort of the old dogma found in textbooks? And so there's really a, a couple of possibilities. Um, either it doesn't, you know, the disease does not burn out, the childhood disease doesn't burn out nearly as much as we thought, or there's a lot more of the so-called adult onset disease, but something's got to happen in those adult years to keep those cases going. So talking about the persistence of the disease, these are some data from uh, the PEER cohort, which is uh, a phase four post-marketing study, um, which was done for uh, Eladel. And uh, looking at the persistence here, um, what this study particularly found was that at every age, more than 80% had symptoms or were using treatment for their AD. So really provocative, suggesting that you know, 80% with persistent disease, um, this is not burning out nearly as much as we, you know, would have thought. Um, and by age 20 years, only 50% of subjects had at least one lifetime, six-month symptom and treatment-free period, right? So they weren't reporting any symptoms, they weren't using any meds, totally clear, so to speak. So only half getting to that point. Now, there's some questions because the cohort was one that used, you know, uh, a second-line non-steroidal agent, um, you know, in terms of the recruitment, could be a different, it's not a population-based sample in the classic sense. So perhaps there's a, you know, this overestimates, but it's quite provocative, suggesting that it really does persist more than we would have anticipated. We did this exercise recently where we did a systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, looking at basically all the studies that were out there that we were able to cull data at the persistence of the disease over time. And from all of these studies combined, got slightly different numbers that by eight years, only 80% of children achieved uh, an reserve period of disease clearance, right? So this is that time to first clearance. Um, and what was fascinating, so these numbers are a little bit closer to what you would have expected from the, from the textbooks, but with this approach, we were able to identify several risk factors. So one, there were a couple, three studies that looked at severity, or stratified by severity, and not surprising, the more severe disease was associated with more persistent disease. But what was interesting was age of onset was, it was one that was a predictive factor. The older the age of onset, the more likely they were to persist. And another aspect was the number of years they were already persistent predicted that they were going to continue and stay persistent. So, you know, there may be a patient who's already pre-wired to be persistent for reasons that are not fully known, and once they've declared themselves to last for that long, the odds are they're going to stay that way for, for perhaps life. Um, but a limitation of this approach was we couldn't examine the recurrence after that initial uh, period of clearance. Um, most pediatric studies found that about 50% of cases uh, begin in the first year of life, and that's really what you see quoted always, about 85% of cases beginning within the first five years. The challenge with these studies is almost none of them have actually looked at the adult period. So there's this assumption that if, you, you know, you're, you can extrapolate the lessons learned of a pediatric cohort to the adult cohort. Well, as it turns out, you get the exact opposite finding in most of the adult cohorts out there. Most of the adult cohorts show that, if anything, you have higher rates of adult onset disease. And there's some uncertainty here because perhaps the patient had it as a child or as an infant, long since forgotten about it. And this is not really adult onset, but really adult recurrence. But you know, from my perspective as a, as a clinician, the take home message is we don't care because when a patient walks in as an adult and meets full criteria otherwise, even if they declare that they've never had it as a child, they can in fact be atopic dermatitis and should be managed as such. Um, it's something that can be, you know, a lot of different patterns can be intermittent or chronic persistent disease activity. Um, there's one study from the isolate study that showed that uh, moderate patients have an average eight flares a year, severe patients on, have on average 11 flares a year. And what's interesting about utilization patterns is many of these patients don't even make it into the healthcare system. Uh, so data from the 2010 National Health Interview Survey showed that about a quarter of adults who reported having, you know, eczema or itchy rash were not seeing a physician for their, uh, for their skin issues. And part of that is related also to limited access to care in the U.S., but there may be other factors at play. So with this, I think we're going to turn. All right, so in an effort to stay dynamic here, we'll switch it up a little bit. And so we'll start by talking about psoriasis, basic incidence and prevalence. Um, similarly to atopic dermatitis, we have much less data for incidence than we do for prevalence, and I'll show you prevalence in the next slide. Unlike atopic dermatitis, most of our data are really for adults, as I'll show you here. <clears throat> so if we just look at incidence first, 
Um, uh, the incidence and prevalence of psoriasis was nicely summarized in a relatively recent systematic review here referenced at the bottom. Um, so for all adults, if we either look at all adults or across all ages, really we see quite a range of incidence rates coming from the United States here at the top, um, coming from medical records, and this is really a population-based study that was done in Rochester, Minnesota. We have ranges from about 60 to nearly 80 um, uh, patients per 100,000 person, 100, person years. Sorry. There have been incident studies in the United Kingdom as well, and this is coming from primary care medical records, and their incidence rate was about 140 per 100,000 person years. And then a study done in Italy really reported the highest incidence rate, uh, also coming from primary care medical records, about 200 to 300 uh, per 100,000 person years. And I'll talk about in coming slides how we define psoriasis and also different study populations, how that impacts our measurements. There have been, again, very few studies done in children. Uh, the uh, incident study in children was done in the same sort of cohort that was done in the United States in Minnesota, again, that was done for adults. And this, was, this incidence rate was estimated about 40 per 100,000 person years, so less than in the adult or general population. Now, what about prevalence? So we have a lot more data to, to uh, tell us about prevalence of psoriasis, both in the United States as well as worldwide. What you can see here are some general patterns, is that psoriasis is generally more prevalent in the Americas as well as in the European countries, with prevalence rates ranging from 2 to 4%. Um, much less common, but also less well studied um, in Asia, China, and Japan. Uh, Australia has similar uh, prevalence rates as we do here in the United States. And then also, again, very few studies in the African countries, um, but a much lower estimated in Tanzania at about less than 0.5% prevalence. Now, there have been fewer studies looking at racial ethnic differences of psoriasis prevalence. A couple of studies here in the United States um, highlighted here. Uh, on the left, I don't know if this mouse is not working. Okay, um, so what we've seen is that in the United States, whites generally have the high, highest prevalence of psoriasis, and it's less prevalent in the racial ethnic minority. So one to two percent in blacks, and um, one to point four to one point six in the other racial ethnic minorities. And this also is in contrast to atopic dermatitis. Now, in terms of psoriasis severity, and we're mostly talking about plaque disease here. It's estimated that about 80% have mild disease, and we'll talk about disease severity definitions in uh, slides to come. Moderate disease is uh, prevalent at uh, about 15%, and about 5% of patients with psoriasis have severe disease. Interestingly, even though blacks have a lower prevalence rate of psoriasis, it's been suggested that they have more severe disease. Now, what about pediatric prevalence? So these, there are very few studies uh, compared to the adult population. And generally, in the pediatric population, the prevalence rates are much lower than they are in the adult population. Again, you see a little bit of a range here, and it kind of depends on whether the, you're measuring a point prevalence or a lifetime prevalence, uh, lifetime prevalence being in the squares. And as you might expect, the lifetime prevalences are a little bit higher. Now, I alluded previously about how we measure psoriasis and what study populations we use and how that impacts our incidence and prevalence rates of psoriasis. So I just wanted to show an example of how this can result in different measurements. So at the top here, I kind of talked about in the, in the previous slide, there are certainly differences of whether we're measuring lifetime prevalence or a point or a pre period prevalence of psoriasis. And these are summaries of some of the prevalence studies that have been done in the US, the upper panel. And again, as you might expect, lifetime prevalence rates measurements are generally higher than period prevalences. Now, what about how we define psoriasis? So there are many different ways to define psoriasis using large databases. So if we look at the NHANES, which is a population-based um, survey study done here across the United States, they define psoriasis by a patient's self-report of whether they've received a physician diagnosis of psoriasis. And based on that cohort, prevalence rates have been measured at about 3%. Now, if we go to the next line down, using medical records from Kaiser Permanente in North Carol uh, North Cal Northern California, sorry, um, so they use definitions based on medical record diagnoses. And so their measurements of prevalence have been a little bit lower at about 0.94%. Um, similarly, using Medicare claims databases, so administrative claims diagnostic codes for psoriasis, again, prevalence rates are a little bit lower. 
The reason for this is because these are you know, people who are going to seek medical care, so there are a number of patients who may not be seeking medical care or may not have you know, psoriasis as uh, significant enough of a problem that it's getting recorded in the medical record or for billing purposes. Now what about the natural history of psoriasis? So unlike atopic dermatitis, this is really mostly a, an adult disease. The average age of onset is about 33 years old. And the majority of patients present before the age of 46. Uh, as you can see here in the bottom graph on the left, um, this is kind of the incidence rates by age. And you can see in general, incidence rates increase until about the seventh decade. And similarly, prevalence also increases on a, a, through about the sixth decade. Majority of patients have plaque psoriasis, about 90%, and this is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. It has a waxing and waning course. Um, however, in one report, uh, or one study, nearly 40% reported spontaneous clearance at any one time, and this ranged from anywhere from one to 54 years, but the longer periods of so-called clearance um, generally is pretty rare for psoriasis. There are a fair number of patients who are undiagnosed with their psoriasis in the U.S. It's estimated for up to about 2.3% of patients do not carry a formal diagnosis of psoriasis. And then in terms of treatment, generally psoriasis patients are undertreated. So a couple of, of um, uh, reports here. So prior to biologics, at least 50% persisted with active disease despite getting treatments. And even in this age of biologics, I'll show you another graph later, most patients are undertreated. So we'll move on to disease severity. Okay. So don't get dizzy, but we're going back to atopic dermatitis. Um, so let's talk a little bit about severity. Um, severity in atopic dermatitis is a very important issue, certainly one that, that's always been an issue, but one that's emerging even more as we move into an era where there's new options for some of these different things. And um, the challenge we have right now is we don't really have universally accepted definition for atopic dermatitis severity. I'm not sure we'll ever get there, um, but at least there are certain concepts that can be applied or, or, or generalized. Um, it's important from an epidemiology standpoint, it's certainly important from a clinical standpoint, because different severity definitions are going to impact your, your definitions in terms of prevalence and, and epidemiology, but also in terms of who gets treated with what. Um, but severity encompasses really several different aspects. I mean, you can have a scenario uh, sort of like the, this patient here, and hopefully you can see the mouse. Great. Um, where, you know, the lesions are relatively mild, but v fairly extensive, covering almost the entire body. So you can have lesional extent that, you know, can really take you up there because the person is just itching all over and, and is impacted on every inch of their body. Or you can have a scenario where you have these more oozing, crusting, nasty lesions in themselves. So the lesions themselves can have a certain severity component. But with atopic dermatitis, uh, perhaps most importantly, uh, or to, to the patient at least, is that symptom burden. So itch, pain, sleep disturbances, mental health disturbances, and that impact on quality of life. And so there's numerous scales out there, and you know, the, the challenge with any of the formal ones used in trial criteria, similar to the fact that you couldn't really use them in the clinical tr you know, practice setting very often, you're not gonna be able to use a lot of these in epidemiology studies. So what we're often limited to is self-report. Now the question is, how valid is self-report? So uh, we actually um, have validated this question, and it, I, just, I don't have enough time to, to finish this and get it out, but it's like 90% done. But it's amazing how well global self-report by the patient correlates with score ads, easies, patient reported outcomes, you name it. I mean, there's some nuances in terms of which ones work better, but it really correlates highly, uh, you know, strongly uh, with that. So, this uh, question of, you know, how would you rate your, your eczema as mild, moderate, severe um, is a reliable one. And this one was used in the National Survey of Children's Health 2007-2008. And the prevalence that was estimated for moderate to severe disease was that about 26% of children with atopic dermatitis had moderate, 7% with severe disease overall as reflected in the pie chart. But what's interesting is there's an age difference because while we expect that a lot of cases of atopic dermatitis will, quote, burn out. The ones that often do persist, as I mentioned earlier, are the ones that are more severe. So when you look at the prevalence distribution based on age, in the younger kids, you actually have a lower proportion in the moderate to severe group. But when you get to the adolescents, you have a considerably higher proportion in that moderate to severe group. And so this is something that um, 
certainly is, is clinically important, but actually has certain ramifications, this in increasing distribution, uh, as you'll see in a second. So what does this reflect to? It comes out to basically about 9 million uh, children with any atopic dermatitis, about 3 million children particularly with moderate to severe disease. That's a fairly staggering number. We don't have direct population-based estimates of the U.S. prevalence of severe or moderate to severe AD in adults. And this is something, you know, it's beyond the scope of this discussion, but there's a lot of technical challenges with nomenclature and other issues that have come up that have precluded the ability to look directly into claims or to even look at sometimes with, with population-based estimates. Um, but if we do a little mental gymnastics and we pair together a number of different uh, estimates together, you'll get to some number of around, from these population-based studies alone, you'll get to a number of somewhere around 0.7 million or so with severe atopic dermatitis who are being treated. Now, you could debate this number, we don't, and, and you should debate this number because we don't have those direct estimates, but it's probably somewhere in that ballpark. Um, when you look in, in the German data sets, um, about 10% of atopic dermatitis patients in Germany were uh, reported to have been treated with systemic therapy. So that may be a greater reflection of the moderate to severe population. I think, though, the, the uh, penetration of use of systemics in Germany is very different than that in the United States and far greater. So but this might be a, a reasonable proxy of severity. So now we're going to flip back over to, to psoriasis. Okay, so how do we define psoriasis severity? There are also a number of different definitions for this. What I'm showing you here is a National Psoriasis Foundation definition based on body surface area involvement. And I think this is what the majority of us use in clinical practice. Certainly we see POSI in clinical trials, um, but nobody uses that in clinical practice. So based on body surface area involvement, uh, three to 10% means moderate to severe, or moderate disease, and severe is defined by greater than 10% involvement. Uh, mild disease is less than 3% of the body surface area involved. I'm showing you here again the prevalence rates for mild, moderate, and severe disease, and you can see that 20% of patients are estimated to have moderate to severe disease, and we do have some population-based estimates uh, of this. Now, we can also think about defining psoriasis severity in a different way. So one other way to think about this is whether or not somebody is a candidate for phototherapy or systemic therapy. What I'm showing you here is taken from um, our most recent, which is a little bit old, psoriasis guidelines from the AAD for treatment. Um, and they break it down like this. Um, so basically, candidates for phototherapy or systemic therapy can include uh, more extensive body surface area involvement as defined by greater than 5%, but also less involvement based on body surface area, but uh, sensitive area involvement, such as genitals, face, scalp, hands and feet, nails. Patients who report significant impact on their quality of life by their psoriasis and patients who are also failed uh, localized or topical therapies can also be considered for systemic therapy or phototherapy. And certainly we know that patients with psoriatic arthritis uh, have an indication for systemic therapy. As I alluded to before, um, despite an increasing number of, of um, efficacious therapies for psoriasis, most patients with psoriasis, especially moderate to severe disease, remain undertreated. And this is a similar problem that uh, Jonathan talked about in atopic dermatitis. So we could certainly do a better job of treating our patients in both arenas. This is data taken from a multinational survey study of patients with psoriasis. And what I want to highlight here is that uh, the, let's see the mouse, okay. Um, so these two bars here on the right are moderate patients with moderate and severe disease. And in the pink boxes, what I'm showing you here, the percentage of patients who are reporting that they are only being treated with either topical therapies or with no therapy at all. So this is definitely something that we should be improving on. Now what sort of impact does this have on our epidemiologic studies and measurements of psoriasis severity and certainly other studies of outcomes and such? So, in using large databases, often body surface area involvement is not recorded um, in, in a way that is easily extractable for us to study. And certainly, so we use surrogate measures of disease severity, and this is where it comes into play, the, the idea of using systemic therapy or phototherapy is a surrogate measure of more severe disease. But certainly, as you can imagine, you know, having moderate to severe psoriasis based on your body surface area involvement does not necessarily always mean that you're getting uh, systemic therapies or phototherapy. And as you can see in the, in the prior graph, most patients are undertreated. So there's probably a fair amount of misclassification where a lot of patients with severe disease defined by treatment uh, 
or sorry, uh, with mild disease by, by treatment probably have severe disease. So how does that impact our studies? So what I'm gonna just show you here is estimates of moderate to severe disease from a United Kingdom uh, population-based database, it's electronic medical record database, and differences in prevalence of moderate to severe disease based on different definitions. So if we look at the top, if we um, estimate moderate to severe disease based on therapy, so for receipt of phototherapy or systemic therapies, uh, the estimated prevalence is about 6%. Now on the other hand, um, Joel Galfen had created this cohort um, within this same database of a smaller number of psoriasis patients um, from which body surface area involvement was collected from general practitioners. And based on that direct body surface area involvement, interestingly, the prevalence of moderate to severe disease is much higher, 48%. So you can see how this can impact our studies, and I, I think Dr. Galfin will be talking about how this uh, also impacts the comorbidity studies. All right, so let's talk a little bit about risk factors for atopic dermatitis. Um, you know, when trying to summarize this, I ran out of room on the slide uh, because you're talking about an incredibly heterogeneous disease. And, you know, I, I make the argument that atopic dermatitis may not be one disease, but really a spectrum of disease within itself or a phenotype, if you will. But a lot of different um, directions uh, in terms of risk factors have been implicated, certainly from the genetic side of things, um, well established in terms of filaggrin null mutations being responsible. But really, uh, you know, even according to the, be the, the best number, so to speak, um, explains only about 30 to 50 percent of cases in Northern European, in patients of Northern European descent or of Asian descent, really doesn't explain the majority of cases even in those groups, and certainly doesn't explain, um, you know, high prevalence rates in patients of African descent, so African American or Afro Caribbean, where there, there are, vir you know, virtually nil rates of uh, filaggrin gene mutations. Numerous other isolated studies have found different, um, you know, mutations and polymorphisms in different genes. The question is how common these are or how causative these really are. When we think about the inflammatory pathways, um, sort of going downstream from a mechanistic standpoint, whether or not you would argue these are risk factors, are there exogenous things that sh trigger these pathways? You know, we know that IL-4, IL-13 and TH2 inflammation is getting a lot of attention. IL-31 in terms of itch and atopic dermatitis. Um, interleukin-5 with the eosinophilia and atopic dermatitis. And there's a number of other pathways that have recently been implicated as well. Um, when we think about you know, classically, this is a disease with barrier disruption. And you could argue the chicken or the egg on this, and there's certainly a lot of heated discussion that goes on at meetings over this point. But whether it's genetically uh, predetermined filaggrin, or, you know, filaggrin mutations, barrier disruption, or acquired, all patients have these barrier disruption. And this is something that leaves them predisposed to all of those exogenous factors. And so they have you know, lower filaggrin, lower ceramides, lower antimicrobial peptides, higher transepidermal water loss. But when you look at the list of exogenous factors, um, they're huge. Uh, certainly climate um, is, a, is one that we see uh, very clinically relevant on all the time. And there, uh, now we've done some uh, ep population-based epi studies that have really confirmed this. Um, ultraviolet exposure within that same sort of class. Uh, microbes. Of course, there's a, a growing recognition of the role of microbiome in general, but how these microbes can really trigger the disease and, and what some of those early life exposures to microbes are in line with hygiene hypothesis, but really not just in the early life in that sense, but really throughout life. Uh, dietary exposures, some population-based data from the ISAC study suggesting that Western diet is associated with higher rates of the disease. We don't really understand that yet, but it's something that, um, you know, diet, certainly patients are very concerned about this, uh, and diet may in fact play a role for many. Um, could food allergy play a role? Well, certainly not in most, but in those patients who do have food allergies, maybe in younger children, patients who have facial reactions, et cetera, food allergens can be a source of reactions for some. Um, irritant exposure is a, a tremendous one in terms of personal care products, water exposure, et cetera, uh, peritogens, things that almost make them itchy, allergens, uh, as I mentioned before, certainly airborne allergens, other contact allergens. Uh, pollutants is one that there's lots of data out there internationally, but really unclear of how much this really drives the disease, but something that yet is known, um, to, at least in some cohorts, to play a major role. And then potentially even certain medications. We have this pattern of drug-induced eczema, which you could argue is really a different disease, but in fact, um, for many of my adult atopic dermatitis patients, ones who've had it lifelong, um, 
you know, there's, they're often on these medications and there's a lot of questions about how much they play a role, if anything. Um, antibiotic exposure is another one because of its impact on microbiome, et cetera. And then there's a lot of behavioral factors as well. And these behavioral factors have been linked cross-sectionally to atopic dermatitis. And one of the challenges with them is the chicken or the egg. Um, is it that these risk factors are predisposing factors for atopic dermatitis or vice versa? So there are studies with obesity that have shown that early life obesity is associated with higher uh, odds of subsequently developing atopic dermatitis. So there, you'd think of obesity as a potential risk factor, at least in a subset, not necessarily in everyone, but in a subset. Yet on the flip side, patients with atopic dermatitis, particularly with moderate to severe disease, tend to be more sedentary, which is gonna be a setup for them to potentially gain weight as well. And the same goes when you go down this list, smoking, alcohol, um, these are poor health behaviors that could be the sequelae of chronic disease, but certainly there are numbers of studies that have shown that these can actually be triggers for their disease as well. Um, stress, stress is a big one. And this, it definitely goes both ways. We see this clinically. Patients will have a stressful event that will just set them off into a full body flare within 24 hours. And, but on the flip side, the disease itself also causes stress. So it's a vicious cycle in this sense. Um, some questions certainly about occupation and it definitely will play a role because there's exposure to friction, to irritancy, et cetera, that may drive the disease. And then there's a lot of controversial data back and forth about whether or not breastfeeding is truly protective or not, if there's any benefit, or versus early life food exposure. So that's one that we still need a lot more data about. Um, but what's fascinating about this is, and really exciting now, is that atopic dermatitis, at least in some, may be a preventable disease. And so <clears throat> this is based on uh, just showing you sort of the, the, the setup of this. Um, there is a number of studies that have shown this, but from this baseline study, which is a birth cohort, uh, measured skin barrier function very early life, at two days and then at two and six months, <clears throat> and then looked at um, the subsequent development of atopic dermatitis and allergies. And in fact, turned out that um, higher transepidermal water loss at day two, even before any visible disease, was predictive of developing atopic dermatitis and food allergy, suggesting that this you know, early life barrier disruption, it, it may start at infancy, at birth, and it's something that will then eventually lead to the development of the inflammatory part of the disease. So theoretically, if you could intervene and, and sort of knock that out, could you in fact prevent the disease? And in fact, there are several studies now that have shown this. So I'm showing you one uh, that was published um, by Eric Simpson, but there's another study that was published in the same edition uh, in Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. And this is looking at um, sort of a, a pilot study, if you will, of 124 neonates that were high risk for atopic dermatitis and you know, started to moisturize daily from about three weeks. And it almost didn't matter what you used to moisturize, but as long as there was adequate moisturizing, um, by six months of age, there was a 50% reduction in atopic dermatitis with no adverse events. And actually, one of our uh, residents at Northwestern actually did a study looking at um, cost-effectiveness of this and really found that, that this is a very cost-effective strategy. Uh, but just to give you a sense, you know, for $7 a year, you might be, or that six-month period, you might be able to save on what is a, an ex exceedingly expensive the disease. Now, there's a lot of unknowns about this because we don't know if this will persist, right? You know, maybe they'll get it at five years of age instead of six months of age. But that could still be enough to, per, to minimize the severity of the disease down the road. It could still be enough to minimize comorbidities from developing, et cetera. So this is a very exciting area as well. I'm gonna turn it back now to psoriasis. Okay. Okay, so similarly, psoriasis is a complex and multifactorial disease. There are certainly genetic and immune dysfunction components that contribute to developing this disease, which you'll hear more about later. And then we similarly also have environmental and behavioral risk factors, both as actual risk factors and then also sort of triggers or modifying factors of psoriasis, as Jonathan talked about for atopic dermatitis. The most established risk factors for psoriasis include obesity. What I'm showing you here are data from a nurse's health study of incident psoriasis. And you can see as BMI goes up, as we go down the table, the risk of developing psoriasis increases as well. Another way to look at this is at the very bottom, for every one unit increase in BMI, increase, the risk of developing psoriasis increases by 
Smoking is the other um, very well-established risk factor for psoriasis as well. Uh, this is coming from similar data, Nurses Health Study, as well as uh, the Health Professionals Follow-Up uh, Study. And again, this is a study of incident psoriasis in people who are uh, um, increasing smoking pack years is associated with an increasing risk of developing psoriasis as well. Now, unlike atopic dermatitis, we don't have preventative studies for psoriasis at this time, so I'm a little bit jealous about that. Um, so maybe that's coming down the line for psoriasis in the future. Here's a list of a number of other triggers for psoriasis. It's unsure whether these are actually risk factors, um, but that has been suggested in the literature. Um, infection, certainly know about streptococcal pharyngitis and the development of gut tate psoriasis, but certainly more data needed to understand whether these are true risk factors or uh, triggers. So um, we got two dynamics. So we got two dynamic, exactly, <laughs> dynamic duo. So you know what, I'm going to just spend 30 seconds whipping through this slide just to show a uh, basic concept here, which is, you know, certainly when you're looking at quality of life, um, the more severe disease, you'll see impacts on global function in terms of short form 36, physical function and mental functioning. But most of these quality of life measures really correlate very poorly with disease severity overall. Uh, but it's something that as you get into more of the skin specific or disease specific measures, you tend to see much more reliable correlations. Um, and part of that is because really the burden of disease here comes from the symptom burden, which is always, often neglected from these global assessments. But in particular, just looking at sleep, sleep seems to be a major predictor of overall quality of life and something that we need to really watch over time. Okay, in the interest of time, I think I will just highlight one slide on quality of life and psoriasis. So psoriasis has a major impact on our patient's quality of life. What I'm showing you here are uh, scores from the SF36, physical and mental health domains. You can see uh, psoriasis has similar or even worse scores than a lot of other chronic um, diseases. Uh, so the impact of this just skin disease on our patients is really, really quite great. One other point here is that our quality of life measures do not correlate with objective, well with objective measures of disease severity. So this is an important aspect uh, that we need to be asking our patients about. So in summary. All right. So you know, we've, we've seen a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. In terms of you know, population-based prevalence, um, differences super common in children, but also turns out maybe not so rare in adults, and in fact a, a disease of adulthood as well. Um, higher prevalences in blacks, females, uh, rural and urban areas. Uh, most pediatric cases seem to begin in early childhood, and a subset will certainly persist into adulthood, but many adult cases seem to pers uh, uh, either begin or recur in adulthood, and that's gonna be an important part for our epidemiology. Numerous risk factors to be thinking about, but some that are actually targetable now for interventions, and that really is exciting. And of course, a major impact on quality of life. Okay, and, and to highlight just a few things about the psoriasis, um, you know, common inflammatory skin disease, predominantly a skin disease of European descent uh, or whites. Um, lifelong waxing and waning chronic course, again, compared to atopic dermatitis, very much an adult disease. Um, obesity and smoking are some of the main risk factors for psoriasis and major impact on quality of life for our patients. Okay, I think we are. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. will cover atopic dermatitis, and Wilson will cover psoriasis. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. We're both delighted to be here to give you a compare and contrast between psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. I'm pleased to be joined by my dear friend and colleague, Professor Ann Bocock. So in terms of conflicts of interests, I do serve as a research investigator for these companies, and uh, Dr. Bocock has no conflicts to disclose. So today, we thought we'd highlight the differences between psoriasis and atopic dermatitis as a culinary battle uh, between uh, myself, Iron Chef Wilson, uh, 
I'll be representing and supporting Team Psoriasis, and uh, I'll be uh, battling my colleague here, Iron Chef Anne, who will be representing and supporting Team Atopic Dermatitis. So may the best chef win. <laughs> so as we've just heard, both psoriasis and atopic dermatitis are complex diseases with both genetic and environmental contributions. We'll be focusing right now on the genetic portion, and we'll be comparing and contrasting for you in three courses. So for our appetizer round, we'll be um, discussing the heritability of each of these diseases, as well as letting you know the gene discovery success to date. We'll then move on to the entree round, where we'll each discuss our signature gene for each disease, as well as discuss how these diseases impact important biological functions such as barrier, antigen presentation, and cytokines. And then we'll finish off with the dessert round, um, discussing the role of ethnicity in influencing the genetics, as well as the, the role of rare genetic variation. So let's go ahead and start with round one, the battle of heritability. So by heritability, we're referring to the proportion of disease that can be explained by genetics as opposed to environmental contributions. So in terms of psoriasis, we know that it is quite familial. In terms of twin studies, identical twins are 70% concordant for psoriasis versus only 23% for non-identical twins. Uh, if you speak to patients with psoriasis, approximately one in three will report that they have a family member affected with psoriasis. And uh, the sibling risk ratio, the risk if your sibling has psoriasis is four to 11 times the rate of the general population. Now, there's a heritability number that ranges between zero and 100, and for psoriasis, that number has been estimated to be about 68%. So, Chef Anne, tell us about heritability for atopic dermatitis. Right, thank you. So, atopic dermatitis, uh, the onset usually occurs within the first two years. And as you heard extensively about prevalence, um, when, when I read the literature, I, I could find estimates of 30% of children. It appears that it's a bit less than that. And only 3% of adults, again, it appears as though it's a bit more than that. Um, but there, we don't know much, as much about um, AD as psoriasis with respect to um, lambda S, for example, um, proportion of first degree relatives in families, I suspect it's even higher than psoriasis. And of course, with atopic dermatitis, there's this observation that 80% of cases have high serum IgE. Um, in terms of concordance with monozygotic versus dizygotic twins, it's very similar to psoriasis, so 72% versus 23%. And for AD, uh, the heritability is estimated at between 75 and 80 percent. You do. Okay. All right, so for the battle of heritability, the winner <laughs> is atopic dermatitis. <laughs> All right. So you may have won the, that round, but you haven't won the war. So now we're coming to round two, the battle of gene discovery. So for which disease have we actually discovered more genetic loci? So what I'm showing here are nine genetic loci in psoriasis termed SORUS 1 through 9 um, that were, have been discovered over the past several decades using largely family studies. So this is aggregating large multi-generational families and using a technique called um, genetic linkage analysis to identify these gene regions. The problem with this approach is that these genetic loci are quite large and it's very difficult to hone in on the causal genes using this approach. And furthermore, it has been difficult to replicate these different loci between different investigators and different studies. Um, and so, uh, more recently, investigators have turned to a different way of thinking about these common diseases, which is sort of the common variant hypothesis. So rather the, the, than there being one or two genes that are really driving the disease, we now think of psoriasis and atopic dermatitis as a disease where it's really the cumulative effect of multiple variants that sort of tip the scale and predispose a person to developing disease. Uh, and using this, um, this, this sort of new paradigm, a new approach has been devised over the past decade called the Genome-Wide Association Study. This is a case control approach whereby you use these DNA chips to measure polymorphisms across the entire genome up to a million different uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in one experiment, and comparing at each position along the genome 
differences between cases and controls. And this technique has been wildly successful. So this is a graph showing you the success for psoriasis. Uh, back when I started in about 2008, we knew three psoriasis genes, including you know, the HLA locus, IL-12B, et cetera. The following year, that more than doubled to eight genes, 2010, 16 genes. And now, uh, as of 2017, we're upwards of 64 mm. psoriasis genetic loci known. So quite impressive in terms of gene discovery efforts uh, based on this new approach to discovering genes. Mm. So in atopic dermatitis, as with psoriasis, the linkage studies with families have given us about nine regions as well, but as Wilson said, as with psoriasis, these are large regions. It's very hard to find a single gene, and so we've resorted to GWAS, genome-wide studies. And for atopic dermatitis, in 2006, there was one gene, which was filagrin, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. You heard about it earlier as well. Um, 2009, there were only two, 2013, 11, and as of 2017, there's 34 regions. Actually, it's 30 regions, and then if you do what's called conditional analysis, you get another four regions. So I have to say that in the battle of gene discovery, the winner is psoriasis. Aha, very good. Okay, so let's now move on to our entree rounds, and each of us will be discussing our signature recipe or gene. So for psoriasis, my signature dish is sea bass, <laughs> namely HLA sea bass, uh, the HLA C 0602 uh, allele. So, just to refresh our biology, what is HLA C? HLA C belongs to the MHC class 1 protein family and is expressed on all nucleated cells. And one of its main functions is to present intracellular antigens, such as viruses, um, to CD positive T cells. Um, so HLA-C0602 refers to a particular version or allele of HLA-C and has a frequency of about 5 to 10 percent in the general Caucasian population. And if you look at these, these genome-wide studies, in every study done, uh, HLA-C0602 is the most significant gene whereby a carrier of this particular allele has about a four-fold increased risk of developing psoriasis compared to a non-carrier. Um, and not only is HLA CO602 uh, important uh, genetically, but it also has some very important clinical implications. So carriers of this allele m are much more likely to develop psoriasis at a younger age. Uh, they're mo more likely to have affected family members. Um, and they're also like more likely to have extensive, uh, more s uh, severe skin disease. Uh, CO602 is more uh, commonly seen in patients with guttate psoriasis. Uh, and more, are also more likely to have the so-called Kebner phenomenon, whereby minor injury to the skin can, can provoke the onset of psoriasis. Um, one of the more exciting um, observations over the past two years has been that carriers of C0602 seem to respond more favorably to ustekinumab treatment, or IL-1223 blockade, so starting now to get into the pharmacogenetics of, of these um, genes. So my signature recipe, or a, a gene, is filagrin mignon. <laughs> so filagrin is expressed in the granular layer of the skin, late in epidermal differentiation, and it's probably involved in cross-linking of keratins. But it does somehow lead to a disruption of the skin barrier, and loss of function mutations are found in 10% of the European population and in 42% of atopic dermatitis, you see these loss of function mutations. So the odds ratio conferred by these loss of function mutations is between approximately three to four or five. Now, filagrin, the, uh, the structure of filagrin is just shown on this slide, and I don't want to hit Wilson with my laser, but um, filagrin is an interesting gene. It has a lot of um, small um, repeats, many, many repeats called filagrin repeats, um, as well as a binding site for the S100 calcium um, 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 EF uh, proteins. Um, and the number of filagrin repeats can actually vary between individuals, and it's also been shown that the number of repeats is, can be lower in cases than controls. Now, the two mutations that were first identified were this mutation in the first repeat, arginine 501, which turned to a stop, 
So it truncated the filaggrid protein to a very short protein, and this deletion of four bases at position 2282, which also truncated filaggrid. So you ended up with a, a very short filaggrid protein in the skin, which presumably had a dominant negative effect or, somehow, or just didn't do what it was supposed to do. So um, for the signature recipe, the winner is a tie. Very good. Okay. So now we have another battle. So round four, we're going to be talking about the battle of the epidermal barrier. Of course, the age-old question has been, is this an outside-in or inside-out disease? In other words, barrier or immune function, which, which comes first or which is more important? Um, so what's not uh, well known is that actually for psoriasis, there is a barrier gene that is um, important. So in 2009, deletion of the late cornified envelope 3B and 3C genes was found as a major risk factor for development of psoriasis in a Caucasian population with an odds ratio of 1.38, so about 38% increased risk. Uh, and this result was replicated in other ethnicities, Chinese and Mongolians. Uh, but interestingly, when psoriasis investigators investigated the role of filaggrin, there was no association of filaggrin with psoriasis. So although both diseases have epidermal components, they seem to be quite distinct. And this is just at the bottom a, um, a zoom in of chromosome 1Q. You can see there are five late cornified envelope genes and that 30,000 base pair deletion in red encompasses those two genes. So in atopic dermatitis, it uh, goes without saying that defects of epidermal barrier are central and that clinically barrier repair with emollients is a mainstay of treatment and prevention. And you heard about that as well with infants um, at early stages of life in, in preventing AD development later on. Um, the uh, psoriasis LCE3B deletion that lies in the epidermal differentiation complex is not found in atopic dermatitis, so there's no association there. Um, Emma Gutman has done an interesting study looking at um, alter, uh, gene expression of uh, components of this uh, epidermal differentiation complex and showed there are broad defects of this in um, AD skin lesions. Uh, filaggrin is also important, though, in uh, leading to other phenotypes in addition to atopic dermatitis, and this is a review from um, Alan Irvin and Erwin McLean, um, and it shows that uh, the uh, filaggrin mutation itself will confer a risk of developing atopic dermatitis of about 3.1, but that it also leads to an increased risk of asthma with an odds ratio of 1.5. And then if you have asthma, and, 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 and that's in the presence of atopic dermatitis, if you don't develop atopic dermatitis, you don't develop asthma, which is interesting, suggesting there are uh, systemic factors from the skin. And then, there's also an increased risk of food allergy, or in particular peanut allergy, conferred by filaggrin mutations. And there the odds ratio is 5.3. So the barrier is very important and can lead to other diseases. Um, I'm going to talk a little more about GWAS later, but it's also interesting that in genome-wide association studies, a number of the associated genes in these regions uh, can also be associated with asthma or asthma and allergy. So there are genes that are associated with, um, with just AD, and one of these is actually a common variant that is uh, close to filaggrin that might regulate its expression, and other components of the barrier in particular. Um, and then there's a couple of genes that are also associated with asthma, IL-13 and CLEX-16A, and then there's genes associated with AD, asthma, and allergy, and they're listed here, and those are a number of immune genes, um, including the MHC. So in the battle of the epidermal barrier, the winner is atopic dermatitis. Okay, so let's move on to round five, the battle of the human leukocyte antigen locus, or HLA. So we've already told you about the signature gene in psoriasis, C0602, but what's remarkable is that the signal in the MHC region is so large for psoriasis that even after you account for all the effects of C0602, multiple other HLA alleles pop up as being independently associated with psoriasis, including HLA-B, HLA-A, as well as the class 2 gene DQA1. 
So really, if you think about psoriasis, it's not an um, association with just one HLA gene. It's really an association with multiple HLA genes. And remember, HLA have multiple functions. They, of course, they present antigens to the immune system, but they are also involved in directly, re directly regulating innate immunity through NK cell receptors and dendritic cell receptors. So these HLA are quite important uh, in multiple facets for psoriasis. In atopic dermatitis, there is an association with the MHC that is reported. Uh, it's with HLA DRB1. Uh, the odds ratio is 0.89, so it's not nearly as uh, pronounced as in psoriasis. And there's also some evidence for some other HLA alleles conferring similar small elements of risk or being protective. But ultimately, um, in, in uh, atopic dermatitis, there isn't nearly the signal for the MHC as there is in psoriasis. And this is a study that I'm doing with uh, collaborators Mark Lathrop and Lauren Mockery, looking at data in the UK Biobank, which cons will ultimately consist of data from 500,000 um, individuals. Um, so far, we've been able to look at 150,000 individuals in the bank and look for associations um, that come up with self-reported psoriasis and self-reported dermatitis. Um, so you can see in these Manhattan plots that consist of um, negative p-values up the uh, y-axis for evidence for association, and then um, the uh, locations of SNPs along the chromosomes uh, listed from 1 to 22, um, and those are, um, and each of those dots is a SNP, and so the red line is the uh, level, uh, the p-value that's considered a significant genome-wide association result. And you can see very strongly that with psoriasis, there's a very, very strong hit with the MHC. It actually goes off the charts. We have to truncate it. And then there's also a strong hit with IL-12B that encodes uh, P40. And then there's other hits, actually novel hits, that we're trying to replicate now in collaboration with Wilson. Um, and then with dermatitis, there's very little association with the um, little evidence for association with the MHC on chromosome 6. And then, of course, this very strong hit on chromosome 1, where filaggrin resides. So you can see the big difference in association with psoriasis versus atopic dermatitis. The strongest hit in psoriasis being HLA-C or CW6, and with atopic dermatitis being filaggrin. And in either case, the reciprocal um, does not apply. So the battle in the battle of HLA, I have to concede to Wilson that psoriasis is the winner. All right. Okay, so moving on to round six, the battle of cytokine loci. So of course, we've all been hearing that for psoriasis, a particularly important cytokine is interleukin-17, right? And of course, generation of the Th17 response uh, depends on the cytokine interleukin-23. Um, so what I'm showing here in this diagram, I've highlighted with a red outline all of the genes that have been implicated with psoriasis genetic studies and in relation to this particular pathway. So as you can see, both subunits of the interleukin-23 protein, P40 and P19, are also psoriasis loci, as, as is the interleukin-23 R uh, receptor. And then downstream of that, you have TYKE2, JAK2, and the transcription factor STAT3, and each of those three have been also identified as psoriasis genes. So virtually every step along that pathway, from IL-23 to binding its receptor to downstream effects, um, has been implicated in terms of the genetics of psoriasis. Now, of course, for psoriasis, we know that another important cytokine is tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now, TNF binds its receptor and also activates an important um, uh, inflammatory uh, transcription factor NF-kappa-B. And what I'm showing here is that there are six psoriasis genes shown in yellow that either activate or inhibit that NF-kappa-B pathway. Um, and so again, there's a concentration of psoriasis genes along these two axes, both mm -hmm. IL-17 and NF-kappa-B. So in atopic dermatitis, uh, I'm just showing you here the different um, roles or the different components, uh, the, 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 what the, the pathways that the GWAS studies have identified. So we have the barrier, um, as we've talked about, we have environmental sensing, there's a new association with a, uh, a gene called Langerin, which encodes, uh, um, encoded by CD207, and then tissue response down here, but the major uh, genes are genes of the immune system. 
Um, and so the ones in red are the cytokines, uh, TSLP, the IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 cluster of cytokines that are encoded by five chromosome 5Q31, IL-2, IL-21 that are like close together encoded by a region on chromosome 4Q, and IL-31. And then there's also a number of other cytokine uh, receptors shown here and other components of that pathway. Um, one of the most interesting and important, of course, is both, well, TSLP, but also the IL-4, IL-13, IL-5, um, IL-4 cluster, um, which is thought to be involved in the development of Th2 cells, which you will not see in psoriasis. Um, interestingly, in psoriasis, and you'll hear about this a bit more, there is an association with the same region. We don't understand what that means, but um, certainly for the battle of cytokines, we decided that uh, there's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what, what uh, Anne and I have been describing so far have been sort of individual studies done either in psoriasis or atopic dermatitis and sort of comparing them indirectly. More recently, a single study directly compared the genetics of these two diseases, studying over 2,000 patients with AD, over 4,000 patients with psoriasis, in comparison to 12,000 healthy controls. Uh, and the first thing, as you see, are these Manhattan plots. If these two diseases were the same, you would expect uh, identical mirror images of each other, but of course you don't see that. Um, but what the investigators of the study did was quite clever. They took all of the significant loci and, and categorized them into one of these four categories. So you can imagine a significant gene or hit could be psoriasis specific, psoriasis only. It could be atopic dermatitis specific. It could be shared effect between uh, increasing the risk of both diseases simultaneously, or it could have an opposite effect, increasing the risk of one while decreasing the risk of the other. So where did, where did the results uh, pan out? So for psoriasis, there were 17 loci identified where it increased the risk of psoriasis but had absolutely no effect in atopic dermatitis. And conversely, for atopic dermatitis, there were five 80 specific genetic hits. Now, here's where I think is a very interesting result. How many loci do you think were shared between the two diseases, given that they're quite common in, in, in the terms of being red, itchy, inflammatory conditions? The result was zero. Not a single genetic locus was identified that both increased the risk of psoriasis and atopic dermatitis simultaneously, and in fact, the investigators found that there were eight genetic loci that increased the risk of one disease while at the same time decreasing the risk of the other disease, opposite effects. And that may um, explain the clinical observation that it is quite uncommon to see a single patient with both conditions. Of course, it does happen, but that's relatively uncommon. And it may be because the genes that are predisposing to one are actually protecting against the other. So that's quite an interesting observation in, in my mind. Uh, and so in conclusion for this study, no loci were identified that increased risk of both, and in fact, there were a number of loci that had opposite effects. Let me move on now to round eight, which is the role of ethnicity. So what do we know about ethnic differences in the genetics of psoriasis versus atopic dermatitis? So for psoriasis, we participated in a study a few years ago, collaborating with our colleagues in Asia, looking at um, Caucasian versus uh, Chinese psoriasis genes. This was a study of over uh, 19,000 Europeans and 15,000 Chinese. And although there were many genes that were in common between Caucasians and Asians, one thing that came out of this study was that there were actually 10 genes shown in the upper left box that were only specific for the Caucasian population and which were not seen at all within the Chinese population. And this may explain to some degree why psoriasis is more common amongst Caucasians compared to Asians, because there's an opportunity for these 10 genes to be, uh, to, to, to have hits in, in these 10 genes, whereas for the Asians, um, these, these risk factors do not exist. Uh, interestingly, there's also another type of variation at the interleukin-23 receptor locus called allelic heterogeneity. That refers to the fact that for uh, Europeans, there were two independent loci identified at that particular gene, whereas for uh, the Chinese population, there was only one uh, independent effect. So even if the same gene affects both populations, there was little subtle differences between those two populations. So again, there are um, distinct ethnic dis differences. And so, Chef Anne, what about for atopic dermatitis? Right. So what I'm showing you here is a, um, 
set of genes and the odds ratios for these genes in atopic dermatitis patients from Europeans and non-Europeans. This was a large meta-analysis done recently by Stefan Weidinger and colleagues. Um, first author was uh, Pat and Oster. So in this um, slide, you can see here are all the genes. So the odds, this is one. So this would be if there's no risk. Um, so here we are, the uh, European risk and the non-European risk, or the odds ratios. So the highest, of course, is filagrin. But again, note that the odds ratios are really small, so less than 1.6. So not even as high as smoking, for example. Um, but then uh, the, the, these other genes look quite similar, the risks in both populations. Uh, however, there are um, a couple of genes that have uh, different trends. And this is a, a novel a protein called LINK, a LINK protein, LINK002299. Um, and interleukin-7 receptor, shown here, asterisk, right at the end, where there's the, and also um, L, um, STAT3. And uh, that's interesting because uh, STAT3 is, is also an important gene that's mutated in a rare disease that we'll tell you about in a minute. Um, there's also a couple of loci that um, could be uh, Asian-specific loci. And this is a CCDC80 gene and an LRP, NLRP10 uh, gene, which is a component of the inflammasome. Um, which is quite interesting, and you can see the hit with NLRP10. It's very pronounced um, in the um, Asians, and you just don't see it at all in the Europeans. So in terms of um, eth ethnicity as well, we also need to look at filagrin. So this, these pie charts show the different mutations in Asians versus Europeans on the right, and the spectrum of mutations is really different. So the two common mutations in Europeans that I told you about before um, you can see one's in mustard, one's in that yellowy green color. Um, but in the Asians, you just, don't, you just hardly see these mutations. And in fact, there's a different mutation, the 3321 del A, and that's the most common gene mutation in Chinese. Uh, it's also associated with atopic march, recurrent skin infections, and food intolerance. And in Africa, uh, Filagrin mut mutations are rare. So there's a great need to look at uh, African populations and what's actually driving atopic dermatitis there, also because the um, prevalence is, is so high. So in terms of ethnicity, uh, Wilson concluded it was a tie. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so we come now to our final battle, the battle of rare variants. So far, we've been discussing psoriasis and AD as common diseases, but of course, there are rare subtypes that seem to be more Mendelian in nature in that they can be inherited uh, in Mendelian fashion uh, through families. Uh, and for psoriasis, this largely is true for pustular psoriasis, so the, uh, including generalized pustular psoriasis, palmal plantar pustulosis, as well as acrodermatitis continua of hel helipo. <coughs> and over the past five years through um, exome sequencing or next generation sequencing approaches, these three genes, IL-36 receptor antagonist, CARD-14, and the autophagy gene, AP1S3, have been identified as having rare mutations that are generally either coding or splicite mutations that generally are, um, drive the disease. Um, and so, um, in a subset of psoriasis cases, there are actually single gene de defects that can actually give you the entire phenotype. Uh, and interestingly, for CARD-14, not only, only can that give you pustular psoriasis, but it can also drive um, the onset of familial psoriasis, as discovered by my colleague here, uh, Dr. Bocock. So in terms of atopic dermatitis, you don't get many rare variants in genes that only cause atopic dermatitis. And so the, the diseases that I'm showing you here are associated with a number of other features as well as atopic dermatitis. So at the top, we have Netherton syndrome that's due to mutations in SPINK5. Now, SPINK5 actually is associated on its own. Other variants are associated with atopic dermatitis. Uh, in terms of hyper-IgE syndrome, which is associated with atopic dermatitis, there are variants or mutations in STAT3, DOC8, and TYC2. STAT3 itself is a genome-wide association risk factor as well. So in a way, it's a bit like CARD14 in that it can cause common and rare uh, forms of disease. 
And then we have Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, where there are mutations in WASP. There are many other um, features of, um, as well as skin in this disease. And then the same goes with um, IPEX, an X-linked um, disease, which is due to mutations in FOXP3, which leads, is important for the de development of uh, regulatory T cells. And IPEX, of course, is also associated with enteropathy. Uh, it can also lead to alopecia, um, or, um, um, endocrine, and uh, uh, autoimmune diseases against uh, endocrine glands, and, um, and a number of other uh, features. So uh, in terms of the battle of rare variants, it's a tie as well. So now we just move on to the summary scorecard. Okay. So it's been an epic culinary battle between these two heavyweight diseases. So where, where do we stand? So as you can see, um, for heritability, atopic dermatitis had the slight edge, whereas for number of gene loci, psoriasis had the clear victory there. Uh, there was a tie among the signature gene, HLAC, for psoriasis versus, versus filaggrin for D. In terms of the barrier, however, atopic dermatitis is king with filaggrin. In terms of HLA, psoriasis had the clear edge with multiple HLA identified versus a very relatively weak signal uh, for atopic dermatitis. There was a tie for cytokines with TH17 for psoriasis versus TH2 for AD. Uh, there was, the, in fact, no shared loci found, but in fact, multiple opposing loci found in that particular study for number seven. And for ethnicity and rare variants, there was a tie. So. Uh, overall, unfortunately, we have a draw today, <laughs> but we look forward to future discoveries and a relitigation of this battle in the future. So we thank you for your attention. <laughs> we have time for one question from this simply Joe. delicious presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Uh, Joel Gelfand from Penn. Uh, similar to the Oscars, I have questions about the accounting procedures that you used for uh, summing this up. Uh, no, you know, I wonder if you can put a clinical spin on this. Uh, how do you counsel an atopic dermatitis patient uh, versus psoriasis patients about what we know about the genetics and how that informs what they should know about their disease? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, um, when I'm, when I'm meeting a psoriasis patient for the first time, I ask about family history, um, which in age of onset, which gives me a surrogate for what I think is the genetic burden uh, for that individual. And uh, if, they, if I feel like they have a higher genetic burden with multiple family members, younger age of onset, more severe disease, that will push me as a clinician to be more aggressive in treatment because they're likely to be more refractory to treatment. Um, but I, I do counsel them and patients are worried about potentially transmission uh, to their offspring and I say that um, there are many environmental factors important for psoriasis including temperature, humidity, UV, diet, etc. So uh, obesity, smoking, modifiable factors. So uh, I encourage patients that there is a lot they, they can do to be proactive about their um, atopic dermatitis or psoriasis. I mean, I think if you typed, if you didn't know, and you typed for filaggrin and eight, for those rare variants, even those two, and uh, HLAC, you'd get a pretty good indication of what disease you were dealing with. But not yeah. everybody has those, those variants. That's the trouble. You'd probably be missing 50% of yeah, uh, cases. As the field of pharmacogenomic genomics improves, hopefully we'll have more predictive power that we can, we can develop a, a gene test to tell who will respond to what medication. Yeah, I, mean, I think on the clinical side, at least taking care of mainly psoriasis patients, uh, my patients have one of two concerns. Either no one in their family has psoriasis and they want to understand, well, how is it that I have this disease? Or they're concerned that their children are definitely gonna have the disease. So I think this information is like, extremely important and clinically relevant. Uh, and the more our clinicians understand how to counsel our patients, I think the better off our patients will be. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Joel. Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to now call up our, our next set, and that's Dr. Uh, Emma Gutman, who is well known to us as a professor of dermatology and immunology uh, and director of the Center for Excellence in Eczema at the Mount Sinai uh, uh, ICANN School of Medicine. She's really uh, very comprehensively identified the molecular basis of the immune pathways in atopic dermatitis. And she is coupled with Frank Nestle, who's currently the global head of immunology and Infl inflammation research therapeutic area and North America chief scientific officer at Sanofi. But he's coming today because of his previous life where he very uh, <laughs> comprehensively defined the immune pathways 
in psoriasis. So we thank both of them for sharing knowledge with us today. Thank you so much, and we are both very excited to be here. I actually met Frank and became friends with him in 2005 when I joined Rockefeller University and he was doing a sabbatical there. So very exciting for me to do it together with Frank, a giant in psoriasis. Yeah, and, and so returning the compliments, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I met Emma uh, in, in her early day careers at Rockefeller, I could already see the, the Keynes sign of, of, of being a future star in the field. And I, I'm glad that this has happened and, and that I can share sort of some of the wonderful signs she has produced and, 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 and some of it we have produced together. Excellent. So, so just in terms of disclosures, uh, I probably should say that, that since September I'm working for Sanofi. It's an amazing experience. I enjoy every single day. Uh, but believe me, we had a Chinese wall for any Dupilumab data uh, uh, we're going to talk about. So I have no clue what she's going to say about Dupilumab, just to, to say that. But there's a really the overarching conflict of interest, which is not on that slide. And it is, this is the marching orders we got from Amy, including a, a one-page email last Sunday, which actually clearly told us what we had to say and what we couldn't. Uh, and, and, and that really includes what are the similarities between psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And this is really sort of the main focus of the talk. Excellent. So overview, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are really reversible. That's wonderful for dermatology. You know, we are never at a point of no return. And that's what, you know, sort of matching our insights into mechanism with these targeted therapies, we know we can go to the patient can say, you know, there's not a point of no return. We can go back. So there are immune-driven diseases. And there's quite a, a lot of similarity, not only in terms of the specific tissue inflammation, but also in terms of, you know, is any of, are any of these diseases more than skin deep? And we are going to discuss that in terms of comorbidities. And then finally, what about non-lesional skin? We have this unique opportunity in dermatology to not only look at the pathology, but also what's happening in non-involved skin and compare that and contrast it. And we're going to discuss that. And finally, what about phenotypes, subtypes? Um, ontologies, ontology of disease, and we're going to give you an insight into how psoriasis and AD might differ, but also where the similarities are. Now, let's start with the basis. This is when I um, sort of started off in, in dermatology, and I said the, the, the pathophysiology of, 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 of dermatology comes from histopathology, and, and if, you look, if you look at the two top rows, from the back, you could actually say, look, these two diseases, atopic dermatitis and, and psoriasis, are not really uh, uh, distinguishable. Both, uh, in, in, in certain stages of disease, have really pronounced acanthosis, elongated radio ridges. Uh, both have disturbances of keratinization. Both have a, a proliferation-associated keratin expression, which is keratin-16. Keratin-16 is sort of this inflammation-associated keratin. If you see it and it's switched on, disease is really active. And if you have a good drug uh, and you do a biopsy, it's switched off. It's like going a light on and off. And, and you can see that this light in terms of inflammation is, is on in both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And if you look at the level of proliferation reflected by key 67 both diseases are highly proliferative. Now, obviously, there has been a slight um, bias in selection because what we selected for the atopic dermatitis is, is, is really a chronic, heavily uh, um, infiltrated piece. I could give you an early atopic dermatitis uh, slide with a lot of spongiosis where this would be not as impressive. But you can see there are a lot of similarities on the histopathology level. Now, what about immune infiltrates? And, and you see uh, to the left normal uh, in the middle atopic dermatitis and, and to the right psoriasis. And you can appreciate that both diseases really um, have not only a pronounced infiltration of, of effector T cells in the dermal compartment, but also in the epidermis. So there is this crosstalk between the immune system and the epithelium uh, at multiple levels. And that's what we're going to dig uh, down to uh, in, in a bit more detail. Now, what about um, cytokines? Uh, you know, all these, these mediators and, and of, of inflammation which we can measure in atopic dermatitis and, 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 and psoriasis. And both diseases went through their fair share of sort of paradigm changes. Psoriasis uh, sort of started off uh, first as an, as an epithelial uh, disease, then it was a Th1 disease, and now we're believing it's a Th7 disease. Who knows what kind of T cell we're going to discover and, and what psoriasis will be, but my bet would be we're, we're keeping uh, uh, calling it a Th7 disease, and you can see that on, on, 
on, on the left side uh, in terms of multiple mediators related to that pathway. What about atopic dermatitis? It's fair share of paradigm changes. You know, it was considered a disease mediated by media, uh, mediators of the arachidonic ar ar acid uh, cycle, leukotrienes. Um, it has been considered a TH2 disease, then again thought of as a TH1 disease in certain cases. Now we have fundamental proof from the clinic that it, it, it's truly a, a, a TH2 disease. But what other cytokines might play a role? And Emma is going to give us an insight into sort of the multi-possible phenotypes uh, of atopic de dermatitis. Now what are the effector cells mediating um, major uh, immune pathologies? And, and they're really classified in, in, a, in a very simple nomenclature. There are Th1 cells, Th2 cells, and then Th17 cells. Th1 cells, which essentially protect us from, from pathogen um, infections, especially intracellular pathogen infections, uh, really they're still on the lookout for, 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 for a true mission and a true pathology, but I can guarantee you it will come at, at one time. Um, then we obviously have Th2 cells, and, and, and they, are, they are sort of driven by very um, effect, uh, important epithelial alarmants, TSLP and R33, and, and, and really are, are able to secrete these important uh, TH2 effector cytokines, R4, R13, which lead, uh, among others, to class switching of, of uh, B cells and production of IgE. And then we have the uh, TH17 um, axis of, of immunity with R23 as the major upstream mediator, which actually turns pre-committed TH17 cells in tissues in the presence of R23 coming from dendritic cells into, into true pathologic effectors. And obviously R17 is a key cytokine. But there are also other shades, and actually in this case, you know, red and, and blue kind of uh, uh, gave, gave this kind of violet or purple box where uh, Emma is going to tell you that, for example, in atopic dermatitis, there are so-called TH22 cells, which might play an important role in disease. So, so not, it's not all like blue and red. Some might be purple, and some really, uh, some of these effector pathways still look for emission. Now, how did our sort of whole perspective in dermatology start out uh, in terms of really being in dermatology and inflammatory skin disease a role model for actually dissecting molecular pathways at the cellular level, but also at the level of communicating between cells via cytokines and using that as sort of a druggable approach. So really doing rational therapy and, and, and you know, psoriasis really can probably take a credit for, for, for a lot of um, uh, 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 the paradigms which we are now using to, to um, essentially study disease, not only in skin, but also in the gut, in, in the lung, uh, and, 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 and also in the joint. And here um, uh, is, is a scheme, essentially what, what puts dendritic cells in, in, in the center of the action, because the dendritic cell is the sentinel which can actually take cues from the innate environment, and this includes uh, cells from uh, in the epithelium, but also innate immune cells, including NKT cells, macrophages, and plasmacyte dendritic cells, and depending on those cues become activated and then actually turn on what is really the important effector arm of our immune system, which is the adaptive immune system, uh, which has memory, specificity, uh, and actually is very active, not only in protecting us from, from uh, pathogens, but as we are seeing, and that's why we are here, you know, creating trouble for our patients. And, and it's really TH17 cells uh, and TH22 cells uh, together, which, which then in, in crosstalk with keratinocytes create trouble by the secretion of multiple pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, which sort of get this um, a vicious circle uh, into motion and create chronic tissue-mediated pathologies, including in the skin in, the uh, in terms of psoriasis or atopic dermatitis. Now, we had a beautiful talk uh, and, and actually a delicious uh, 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 e even talk uh, about genetics. And this is my one uh, uh, sort of uh, genetic slide. Uh, Kurt, uh, you know, I, I have to mention Francesca Carpon as, as, a, as a main contributor to, to this conceptual idea. But essentially what it tries to do is, is put the R23, R7, pathway in the context of genetic variants which have been associated with either disease susceptibility or protective uh, um, uh, function uh, to disease. And you can see that in the lightly shaded uh, uh, molec uh, molecules here, both uh, the, the uh, uh, heterodimer of, of IL-12B and IL-23, the IL-23 receptor, very interesting um, uh, jack kinase, uh, TIC2, adapters of, of IL-17 
um, are, um, are signaling, and then positive and negative regulators of NFKLB, as we, as we heard in, in the previous talk. Now the, now, the interesting element is really that if we, if we think about the drugs which are, which are either in the clinic or in, on, on their way to the clinic and, and, and really have already provided substantial um, a sort of a clinical footprint uh, e uh, either uh, at, at the bedside or, or in clinical trials, then it's amazing how, how if we map these genetic variants onto a pathway such as IL-23 and uh, IL-17, IL how these drugs are really kind of pointing to, to very important points. And I, I can tell you that probably in the future we see more drugs along this pathway uh, potentially coming uh, 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 next to a patient near you. Now, how does the um, IL-17 pathway really play out in the epithelium? And this is, this is the $100 million question we heard about the importance of, of uh, um, essentially the epidermal barrier. But it's not only the disruption of the epidermal barrier, it's that the epidermis is fundamentally a pro-inflammatory organ. Uh, and if you think about a very simple entry into, into thinking about this by an, a dendritic cell producing IL-23 and, and actually switching this pre-committed uh, uh, TH17 cell or, or uh, actually innate uh, a cell into an IL-17 producer, then, then we have an action both on, on neutrophils, uh, you know, linked with neutrophilic infiltrates, you know, typical in, in, in psoriasis, but also, probably more importantly, the, uh, uh, an important alarm signal for the epidermis, which then leads to a secretion of a variety of pro-inflammatory chemokines, cytokines, and growth factors. But there's also the IL-17 of the epithelium. There's an IL-17 of, of, of circulating immune cells, IL-17 A and F, but there's the IL-17 of, of the epithelium, which is IL-17C. We have not seen much about this, but it's a very interesting cytokine, which can in an autocrine manner actually act back on the epithelium. And we have other IL-17 family members, including IL-25, IL-17E, uh, which need further study to really understand how they are fitting into this uh, pro-inflammatory picture. Now, coming back to the IL-23, IL-17 axis, uh, this is another uh, depiction now moving away from genetics, but, but looking at the fundamental uh, key cytokines. And, and for me, having started on this journey in, 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 in the 80s and, and, and having witnessed how we moved from essentially a pathogenetic talk uh, just at the beginning of the meeting and all the clinicians were saying, well, what, what is this really doing? We cannot do rational uh, 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 drug therapy. If we look at this, at this picture, you know, that clearly, in, in my mind, uh, establishes the, 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 the principle which we are now seeing playing out. And, and I think we will hear in the therapeutic session much more about the specifics, uh, about the, 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 the specific uh, capabilities of these drugs to make uh, changes in, in, in patients. So I'm handing over, finally, so uh, to Emma. <laughs> So I think it was very important to hear the story for psoriasis because I think in atopic dermatitis we are following the footsteps of psoriasis and in fact when I started in atopic dermatitis in 2005, things were really not clear for atopic dermatitis. It was not clear what do we need to target. Do we need to target the barrier as we heard or we need to target the immune system. And what is becoming clear now that we really have a paradigm shift in the pathogenesis of atopic dermatitis. Because it doesn't really matter what starts first, if it's the barrier or if it's the immune abnormalities. What matters, and that's a very key point, is that the perpetuation of atopic dermatitis and moving from non-lesional skin to chronic disease is due to increases in cytokines. And that's why you heard there are now approaches to prevent atopic dermatitis, and they are targeting the barrier. However, once you already have the phenotype of atopic dermatitis, you have to target the cytokines or the immune abnormalities. And that's a very important consideration. So what do we have uh, here? We have cytokines that increase already at the non-lesional skin. That's a big difference from psoriasis. In psoriasis, the non-lesional skin is much closer to normal. However, in atopic dermatitis, how do I activate the... Yeah, I just can use the pointer here. Yeah, so here. Yeah. Just move the pointer. I can move the pointer for you. you <laughs> so we have a cytokines that already increase in the non-lesional skin, and that process is increased or amplified in acute disease and even more in chronic disease. So what cytokines we have? We have the TH2 cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, 
that inhibit antimicrobial peptides. And there is very important research from Donald Leung showing that these antimicrobials are decreased in atopic dermatitis. And we show that they are actually increased in psoriasis. And we need to remember psoriasis patients do not have infections, whereas patients with atopic dermatitis have infections. And the same IL-4 and IL-13 inhibit barrier proteins such as filagrin that you heard about, and many others, loricrin, involucrin, and also lipids. We have the IL-31 that also is derived as a TH2 cytokine and starts the each scratch-like unification cycle. We have IL-22 that we described back in 2009 that starts the hyperplasia in atopic dermatitis, also disrupts the barrier with decreasing uh, decreases in filagrin, loricrin, and uh, involucrin, and also synergizes with IL-17 that is so important in psoriasis to produce the S100s. And this process is, again, amplified in chronic disease and has a very important relevance to treatments that are being developed right now. So how do we test the immune hypothesis that I put forward? A prediction of this model is that immune suppression will be able to reverse the epidermal pathology we now have in atopic dermatitis. This hypothesis will be rejected if immune suppression is achieved, but the epidermal phenotype of atopic dermatitis is persisting. And due to time, I will show you only one proof of this hypothesis using dupilumab that is an IL-4 receptor antagonist. And I like to always start with this first proof of concept study that was a phase 1B study, was actually designed for safety, but luckily had mechanism. And I think it's a nice first proof of this hypothesis. This study was a small study, only 67 patients across several continents, a four-week study in which uh, injections of uh, 75 milligram, 150 milligram of dupilumab, and 300 milligram and placebo were given. And luckily, 18 patients participated in a biopsy sub-study. Now, the results were already significant by week two in the 300 milligram group, and even more by week four. It was clear cut that there is dose response here, and the treatment was effective. Importantly, there were no differences in responses of patients between patients that had high Ig level and patients that had low <laughs> Ig level, and also patients that had filagrin mutations and patients without filagrin mutations, and that is important. Now, my lab studied the molecular changes in the disease with dupilumab. For that study, we did not have immunohistochemistry, but as you heard from Frank, keratin-16 is a very good marker of epidermal hyperplasia or epidermal proliferation. And we got a dose response here as well. We did not have 75 milligram. We only had dupilumab 300 milligram biopsies, biopsies from patients that were treated with the 150 milligrams and biopsies from placebo. And this is a logarithmic scale. So in dupilumab 300 milligram, we received about 10-fold change decrease in keratin-16, about two-fold change decreases with the 150, and in placebo, we actually got an exacerbation, and that was surprising because we all know the high placebo responses we usually have in atopic dermatitis. This is why it's so important to do these tissue studies because in tissues, we actually got an exacerbation. On the left side, you see a heat map of many markers we performed by real-time PCR. And we looked at multiple axes. We, just, we didn't look just at the TH2 axis. We wanted to see what happens with other axes. And we were quite surprised. And blue is suppression or downregulation. Red is upregulation. You can clearly see marked suppression of markers in the 300 milligram. Whereas you see in placebo that there is upregulation of many markers. And these go far beyond the TH2. So yes, we did receive, as we expected, reductions in the TH2 axis, including the chemokines that are very important in the TH2 axis, CCL17, 18, 22. But look at that. We have reduction in IL-23A. This is P19. And S100 that is induced by IL-17 and IL-22 and many others. So dupilumab really reduced many markers, and you will see the same in a phase two study that we will publish later on, hopefully this year. And I want to show you from this larger phase two study, it was a phase two mechanistic study that we did, that uh, we now prepare the manuscript. And this study actually did have immunohistochemistry, was also a longer study, it was 16 weeks, and we had biopsies at baseline at four weeks and at 16 weeks 
and uh, it included 54 patients, 27 patients on placebo, 27 patients given drug. And here you can clearly see reduction in the epidermal hyperplasia, really major reduction with dupilumab. In fact, at week 16, the lesional skin looks very similar to the non-lesional skin. And the keratin 16 that is so important to show that the disease is turned off, as you heard from Frank, entirely disappears in dupilumab-treated patients, whereas it's still maintained in placebo-treated patients. And we also looked at filagrin. Filagrin is a very good marker to see how is the barrier reversed. And usually, we see in patients with atopic dermatitis in lesional skin skipped expression of filagrin, whereas you want to see a nice continuous line of filagrin, which is what we see at week 16 with dupilumab, but not with placebo. So we have reversibility of the barrier with dupilumab, and we do not see that in the placebo patients. When you look at the epidermal thickness, you see that the median change with dupilumab is more than 40%, whereas you do not see that with placebo. So I hope I convinced you that dupilumab impacts both the inflammation but also the barrier dysfunction that characterizes atopic dermatitis. And I think this establishes IL-4 and IL-13 as pathogenic cytokines for atopic dermatitis. But more importantly, I think this cements atopic dermatitis as immune-driven and reversible, very similar to psoriasis. We did not have such a proof before because we did try to show it with other studies like cyclosporin and narrowband UVB, but these affect the epidermis. So it wasn't a final proof. This is the first final proof that atopic dermatitis is immune-driven and reversible. All right, thank you very much, uh, Emma. We're now going to shift gears a little bit um, and, and actually moving to a question is, is, is the sort of skin inflammatory phenotypes we, we described, are they more than skin deep? Uh, and, and I guess, again, psoriasis sort of was setting the scene um, in, in terms of making the case. As clinicians, we always knew that we had patients with psoriatic arthritis and about 20% of patients nail psoriasis is quite prevalent. But I think the fact that up to 50% of these patients suffer from metabolic syndrome with dyslipidemia, insulin-resistant diabetes, obesity, arterial hypertension, then as deadly uh, uh, quartet, leading to sequelae such as um, stroke and, and uh, myocardial infarction and death. Uh, this was unappreciated. And Joel Gelfand in the audience here and others really have kind of made the case that this is a very important contributor to the overall pathology. And I think there will be much more to come to understand how really local inflammation is kind of playing out in the context of systemic inflammation, cardiovascular sequelae, and how we ultimately are in a position uh, to drug this. Now, i just show you one data slide which sort of compares uh, severe psoriasis and AD. We would all subscribe, and this is from Knut Krakwell, this group, uh, and published in 2015, we would all subscribe to the view that psoriasis can lead to these kind of severe calcifying events and, and in, in, key, in, in key cardiac uh, vessels, and this is shown with a, with a cardiac um, CT plus an angiography. But if you look here uh, uh, in psoriasis in, uh, uh, in blue, and AD uh, in red, and, and here you see the percentage of essentially atherosclerotic um, segments uh, in, in, in the heart of patients, uh, you can actually see uh, multiple, um, multiple things. One is if you compare it to controls in, in green, there are, there's more atherosclerosis going on in, in, in heart vessels than, than uh, in, 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 in heart vessels of, of inflamed um, uh, skin um, patients uh, than, than in controls. But what's really interesting that this is also playing out in mild disease. So really it's mild disease, already patients with mild disease who have a lot of these features, and that actually AD really stands up to psoriasis in, in this. Now, now, this is not really any epidemiology would say, like, what, what can you do with this data? This is just sort of making an argument here that AD really is, is, is also a systemic disease uh, uh, with multiple potential sequelae, and, and Emma is going to drill down into this a little bit now. Yeah, so we have very exciting data that atopic dermatitis emerges as a systemic disease, and I think the future years will show it much more. And it's important also to see how the treatments reverse that uh, systemic disease effect of atopic dermatitis. 
Now, this is a paper uh, from the International Eczema Council. Uh, this is the first paper actually that we uh, did as a group in which we looked very deep into the emerging uh, systemic abnormalities of uh, atopic dermatitis. And we saw that there is a, an increased evidence of a cardiovascular a disease. A lot of the data comes from Jonathan Silverberg, but also others, infectious manifestations, neuropsychiatric, and other comorbidities a, in atopic dermatitis. And this is in addition to the known allergic or atopic manifestations, because these were known for a long time. Now, this is a meta-analysis that was done by my own group in which we took all the published uh, molecular transcriptomes of atopic dermatitis, and we put them together into a robust disease phenotype in tissues, robust transcriptome. And we were quite surprised, and I can tell you that the psoriasis uh, meta-analysis did not show it actually as a top uh, pathway. We were very surprised to find the atherosclerosis signaling actually being represented really at the top in atopic dermatitis. Now here is the place to ask, what is the level of systemic inflammation in atopic dermatitis versus psoriasis? And of course, each one versus their own control. But for psoriasis, as you heard, we now have quite a lot of evidence that there is systemic inflammation. A lot of data from Joel Gelfand and others really put this very nicely forward for psoriasis. What happens with atopic dermatitis? So both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are characterized by T-cell activation in skin, but their comparable systemic T-cell activation in blood was really unclear. So we set up, my group set up to uh, evaluate this. And what we did, we evaluated by flow cytometry T-cell activation markers, ICOS, that is a mid activation marker, and HLA-DR, a late activation marker. And we did it in both central and effectory memory skin homing AA cells. In both skin homing cells that are marked by CLA positivity, CLA is cutaneous lymphocyte antigen positivity, a very good marker for cells that home to the skin. And CLA negative, or I like to call them the circulatory cells that stay in the circulation and do not home to skin. And we did that in both uh, atopic dermatitis controls and together with Jim Kruger in a collaboration, we also looked into psoriasis. And we were quite surprised by the findings because we saw that atopic dermatitis doesn't have just excess T cell activation compared to controls, but it also had T cell activation uh, increases uh, in the uh, circulation compared to psoriasis. Now psoriasis, and that's for all the markers of activation, both ICOS and AGLADR, and in both CD4 and CD8 cells, psoriasis actually was higher than controls, but atopic dermatitis was very significantly higher, not only compared to controls, but also compared to psoriasis. Now we also, and this is a recent publication that we have in GID, we also looked at circulatory cytokines and chemokines in the serum, and we looked at a panel that included Th1, Th2 markers, and also IL-22, and we saw really high increases in the serum in these markers. We have here IL-22, IL-13, and several chemokines from the Th2 pathway, but very importantly, these markers were not just increased in the serum compared to controls, they were highly associated with scorad. So the increase was highly correlated with the increase in the scorad. So the more severe patient you have, they will have higher increases in these circulatory markers. And why is this important? In another study in which we treated patients by cyclosporin, we evaluated the same markers. And we saw decreases in these markers, and not only we saw decreases, the decreases were associated with the decreases in disease severity by SCORAD. So we need to ask, are these modifiable risk factors that we can evaluate in blood? Now, we all know by now that the non-lesional skin of atopic dermatitis patients is abnormal, and I think the systemic immune activation that we have in atopic dermatitis is reflected in the abnormalities in non-lesional skin that you can see here. So already in non-lesional skin, you have activation of the cytokines, the Th2 and Th22. You have increases in IL-13 and the chemokines, CCL17, 18, 22, and many chemokines of the Th2 pathway. And you have increases 
in uh, TH2, IL-22, NDS-100. So the non-lesional skin of atopic dermatitis, even though it looks normal, maybe it's a little bit dry, it's not normal. And that is due to the systemic cytokine activation. So I think I managed to convince you here that atopic dermatitis does emerge as a systemic disease with high-grade systemic immune activation that we have of T cells, circulating cytokines, and I didn't have time to show you, but also B cells. And I think this is the common denominator that leads not only to the allergic or atopic manifestations, but also to other comorbidities that are emerging, such as cardiovascular infections and others. And this has very important therapeutic implications because you cannot treat patients with severe disease just with topicals because you have systemic immune activation, their non-lesional skin is defective. So this really emphasizes for severe patients the need for systemic treatment approaches. Now we'll switch gears and we'll ask, and this is a big passion of mine, is atopic dermatitis a single disease or the same phenotype? We know that psoriasis is quite homogeneous. Is the same in atopic dermatitis, a disease that has several variants that has, have been described, acute and chronic, intrinsic, patients with a normal Ig versus extrinsic, high Ig levels, pediatric versus adult, filaggrin positive, filaggrin negative, and what about Asians and uh, European Americans or Western uh, patients? And why is this so important? Because if it's a global disease phenotype, it will imply that similar treatments apply for all. If these are different phenotypes, they might require different therapeutic approaches. So the stratification of atopic dermatitis phenotype might be important for developing a personalized treatment or personalized medicine approach for atopic dermatitis. I don't have time to go into all the phenotypes, but I want to show you uh, my research on Asians uh, atopic dermatitis compared to European American. And this study was done jointly with my friend from Japan, Kenji Kabashima, and also Kwang Kun Lee from Korea. So what is the idea behind this study? Although comparative data were not available at the time, there were some observations that suggested that Asian atopic dermatitis may be different than European-American atopic dermatitis. First of all, there were some reports about differences in the clinical phenotype, as you see here in this representative picture. Asians have more well-demarcated erythem erythematous plaques, a little bit more similar to psoriasis, whereas in European-Americans we know it's blending with the surrounding. There were epidemiological differences. In the United States, we are talking about 3 to 7 percent of adults, and that's a high estimate. But in Asia, there are reports up to 10% of the adults in Asia and around 25% of the children in Asia. And very importantly, I kept seeing repetitively studies from Kenji Kabashima's group showing increases in IL-17 producing cells, both in skin and blood. And in fact, I did not replicate this data in my own um, European-American patients. So thus, we did a study in which we compared 27 Asians that were from Asia, from Japan, and from Korea to 25 European Americans. And what is important here is that all the Asians, besides one patient, had very high increases in IgE with a pre-identified biopsy of atopic dermatitis. And that is important because when we saw this data, we were really struck. The Asians, many of them, had real features of psoriasis including vastly increased hyperplasia, much more than we see usually in atopic dermatitis in European Americans, with parakeratosis that usually is not a feature that we see in European Americans, and focal hypogranulosis. And when we looked at the epidermal thickness of all the patients, Asian is in blue, European American is in red, we saw increases in the thickness, not just in lesional skin, but also in the non-lesional skin of Asians. So what happens with the immune pathways? In uh, Asians, we see similar TH2 activation. As you see here, IL-13 is not there in psoriasis, as we already heard. Psoriasis doesn't have a TH2 pathway. The Asians and European-American AD did have increases in TH2 axis, maybe slightly less in the chemokines, but overall, the same picture applied for the TH2 axis. However, when we evaluated TH17 and TH22 axis, we saw that the Asians were an in-between phenotype with increases in IL-17 compared to the European Americans, not as high as in psoriasis. 
but it was certainly increased. The same with IL-19, a cytokine that is associated with IL-17, and the same with IL-22, and the chemokines, they all showed a trend of increases in Asians. And when we did an unsupervised clustering using a principal component analysis, the, the red is uh, marking the Asians. The Asians were really in between European Americans and psoriasis and in between phenotype. And that may have some relevance to treatments. So importantly, all the atopic dermatitis subtypes are characterized by T cell activation, and that T cell activation is setting up the epidermal responses. But some subtypes also show differences in their immune profile and might necessitate different treatment approaches, including those that are applied now so successfully to psoriasis, IL-23, IL-17, and IL-22. I don't have time to go much into it, but I want to show you a few studies. This. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at my last slide, <laughs> last three slides. So. <laughs> I promise to do I, it. I have it in writing that I want her. <laughs> no, I'll do it very quickly. So this is a, a study we did with ustekinumab. Ustekinumab is a treatment available for psoriasis for a long time, anti-IL-12, IL-23. It was not so well designed as we understand now because it was a crossover design of 32 patients that were crossed over at week 16. And a 16 patients started with ustekinumab, 16 patients started with placebo. Another a, a, a factor here was that we gave patients jars of a, topical steroids. We now know that it's a no-no in atopic dermatitis studies, and that probably affected the study. And another caveat here is that we use psoriasis dosing. I showed you that atopic dermatitis patients have much more immune activation, so psoriasis dosing is not enough for atopic dermatitis. But nevertheless, I think it does show a trend of efficacy, because if you look, the group that started with ustekinumab in the beginning, they improve quite a lot. Then they probably did not give their dose that they should have gotten here, and that's why they have a decline. But they maintain their efficacy. At week 40, you have 50% score at 50 responses in the group that started with ustekinumab, and I think that is still impressive. But I think definitely we need other studies. This was not at all definitive. And I want to show you briefly that it does reverse, actually, the molecular phenotype. When you look at week 32, there is a reversal of the phenotype in the group that started with ustekinumab. And already by week four, you see changes in that group. And interestingly, some of these changes are a reduction in TH2 markers, and that we need to understand some more. And um, we have an exciting study with an anti-IL-22 that we will present later on at the SID. This is a representative patient with very lichenified lesions, and this is how she looks three months after. And I will give you a teaser. It's a positive study, at least in a subset of patients, and we will present it later on at the SID. Sorry about going over. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief. You can read a summary for yourself. I just would like to say thank you very much, Emma. It was, it was fantastic to be on stage with you. I hope to be repeated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I'll get started. We don't have much time. Um, I want to introduce the speakers on comorbidity that don't need much introduction. Um, the first speaker uh, on atopic dermatitis is uh, Eric Simpson. Uh, Dr. Simpson is a professor of dermatology, and he heads the uh, clinical trial uh, uh, unit at Oregon Health and Science University. He specializes in all aspects of dermatology, but as you know, he has a special interest in atopic dermatitis and inflammatory skin diseases in both adults and children. For psoriasis, our speaker is Joel Gelfand. Uh, Dr. Gelfand is a tenured professor of dermatology and epidemiology at uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania, a uh, Perlman School of Medicine. He is also vice chair of clinical research and medical director. Um, one second of the uh, uh, clinical trial unit. 
uh, and director of the Psoriasis and Phototherapy Treatment Center and the founding director of the Patient-Centered Outcome Research uh, Center at Penn uh, Graduate Epidemiology Master Degree Program. So. Yeah. We're just chit-chatting over here. Uh, all right, so um, let's see, Eric and I are going to do his old school a little bit. I'm going to start talking about comorbidities and psoriasis, and Eric will talk about an atopic derm. And we're going to switch off every sentence, actually. Every sentence, right, exactly. Now, we don't want to give you too much whiplash, uh, but we try to have an organized framework of what we're discussing, and you'll see the comparisons and crashes as we go through it. Uh, my disclosure slide, I should say, is uh, in your handout. Uh, I do consulting with some companies make products related to psoriasis and release some grants for them. And you're, you're okay if I sit down? Yeah, please okay. enjoy yourself, yes. Uh, okay, so, um, so this is sort of the, the, the paradigm that we've been studying for the last uh, well over a decade now which is to bring other talks into this, uh, to develop a phenotype of psoriasis, you need to have environmental exposures and genetic exposures. Uh, and so many of these, the way we think about it as, as epidemiologists, is how these relate to both psoriasis uh, and cardiovascular disease, being shared risk factors. And, and then when you have uh, psoriasis, uh, you're exposed to chronic inflammation, uh, certain types of treatment, uh, and a burden of disease. And all these different factors, be the risk factors, the pathophysiology, or these other factors could commingle to promote comorbidity, or in this case, we'll talk about cardiovascular disease as a model. Now, this is sort of discussed by some of the other speakers, but this is a really interesting heat map from Nature that came out. And I'll try and use the, um, the mouse, it'll pop up here, it won't. Kind of pointer. So it, basically, the more closely two conditions are related genetically by these expression studies, the more close they appear on this graph. And so psoriasis in the middle here, and you see atopic dermatitis at the edge over here. With atopic derm, at least genetically, um, commingling with asthma, allergy, uh, primary, primary uh, sclerosis and cholangitis, migraine. Psoriasis more in the middle here, closer to Crohn's disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and certain metabolic uh, conditions of cholesterol, uh, which sort of puts some context into some of the at least cardiometabolic comorbidities we see in psoriasis. And so uh, there's a couple of fundamental things we need to think about in psoriasis. One is the immune abnormalities are profound. You have to have billions of T cells infiltrating the skin to maintain this phenotype in people with psoriasis. Um, and the disease is largely uncontrolled. In Junko's talk, uh, she mentioned that roughly 90% of patients who have severe psoriasis, 10% by surface area, are essentially on no treatment whatsoever. From older work done in the field, uh, what we know is that the more severe your skin disease is, uh, the more likely you are to have increases in systemic inflammation, be it C-reactive protein, ICAM-1, and serum amyloid A. And these three are all known to be cardiovascular risk markers and healthy controls. So again, suggesting shared pathways. And this leads to the unifying theory, if you will, that inflammation may be a common pathway to a variety of diseases, including atherosclerosis, obesity, and insulin resistance. So this is now a summary slide of about uh, 10 years of work. And essentially, we're using large population-based data sets, uh, hundreds of thousands of patients, essentially, looking at the rates of cardiovascular events, controlling for traditional cardiovascular risk factors available us in EMR data, so smoking status, BMI, diagnosis of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And what you'll see is that when people have more mild disease, they didn't receive systemic therapies of phototherapy, for example. They have small associations with these major cardiovascular outcomes. And then those who have more severe disease, they got phototherapy as systemic agents, uh, they have more clinically significant rates of these, uh, of these outcomes. And the clinical significance is that, they, that people with moderate severe psoriasis die about five years younger than they should based on their risk factors for mortality. And think of it as a dermatologist, uh, a person with moderate severe psoriasis is about 30 times more likely to develop a major cardiovascular event, somehow attributable to their skin disease, as opposed to their measured risk factors, and they are developing melanoma. So we all know melanoma is a really important problem for our patients. This is puts in perspective for you uh, how important cardiovascular disease is for patients with psoriasis. Uh, now, I think as Eric's talk will allude to, uh, this work's been going on uh, for a longer period of time in the psoriasis field. The first reports of psoriasis and diabetes date back to the uh, late 1800s, actually, in the German literature. Uh, but we focus on cardiovascular disease. There's hundreds of papers being published a year now on this topic, over nine meta-analyses, all largely confirming uh, our initial findings in this field, uh, that more severe psoriasis is associated with higher rates of cardiovascular events.
Now, more recently, what we've tried to do is understand uh, how psoriasis compares to another major uh, TH1 disease, if you will, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, in the same data sets, large UK population-based data. And what you'll see is something specific in psoriatic disease that promotes diabetes, independent of body mass index, that you don't see in people with RA. And then those getting systemic therapies, largely methotrexate in both populations here, those with psoriasis have fairly similar rates to, of major cardiovascular events like death, uh, and even slightly higher rates of all-cause mortality. And again, this is independent of uh, simultaneous analysis of risk factors for these events. And so this led to some investigators in the room literature suggest that severe psoriasis <coughs> should, be should be considered in the cardiovascular risk score. And so more recently, what we try to do is move past using treatment patterns as markers of disease severity to directly asking the GPs uh, to, to uh, categorize how bad the skin disease activity is. And so using these simple National Psoriasis Foundation uh, categorizations, uh, what we see is that as you go from mild to moderate to more severe disease based on body surface area, you have a dose response in the odds of having uh, major cardiovascular disease at baseline in this cohort study we're doing. And this is a large study, it's 9,000 patients uh, with psoriasis, 90,000 controls, uh, and very high response rates. The GP response rate was close to 95%. This was a system set up for medical research and they're compensated for this. Bringing back some of the concepts from the earlier talks, uh, Jim Kruger on the left side of the screen is showing that uh, metabolic and cardiovascular risk gene expression is much elevated in patients with psoriasis compared to uh, normal patients. That some of these proteins uh, circulate systemically, so like renin, for example, which we know promotes hypertension. Uh, and so what we conclude from this is that the skin itself may drive uh, distal comorbidity. And then this is work by Nicole Ward's group, seminal paper here, looking at a mouse model of psoriasis. When the gene contract is expressed just in the skin, these mice eventually develop aortic disease and thrombosis, uh, suggesting again proof of concept that this chronic psoriasis-like inflammation in the skin of a mouse could ultimately result in, uh, in distal comorbidities. Uh, and I'll briefly allude to this work, this will be talked about more at this upcoming meeting, which is that we've been using imaging biomarkers as a way of looking at systemic inflammation and psoriasis. So in 18 FDG PET-CTs, uh, it's felt that radio label glucose is selectively taken up by CD68 macrophages. Um, and this is an interesting biomarker because it's known to be predictive of cardiovascular events when we're looking at the aorta. We know that it improves with uh, therapies known to lower risk of cardiovascular disease, like statins. And increasingly, in early phase studies, it's using it as a surrogate for drug discovery to look for agents that may lower cardiovascular risk. And so what, working collaboratively with Nehal Mehta, who's now at NHLBI, what we've shown is, uh, one is if you have psoriasis, you have increased aortic inflammation equivalent to being about 10 years older than you are chronologically, independent of your risk factors. And then more recently, what Nehal's group has shown here is that as your positive score goes up, severity of your skin disease goes up, uh, that, the, uh, that your um, aortic inflammation goes up uh, in direct correlation with that, independent of all the detailed measurements of cardiovascular risk factors you could do. So at a population level, we could show uh, strong associations with events, cardiovascular um, uh, mortality, if you will, uh, independent of uh, risk factors we can only measure not so tightly. You know, we sort of know they smoke, but how much do they smoke? We know their BMI, we don't necessarily always have their blood pressure, for example. And in Nahal's cohort, it's not an event study, but very tight control for confounding. So there's been a lot of work uh, rapidly going on in this field. Uh, so uh, another group has shown that psoriasis is associated with increased arterial inflammation on these PET-CT scans, but also that extends into the subcutaneous fat. And then another group showed that the adipose under psoriasis plaques expresses microRNAs that modulate lipid metabolism. So there may be a, an epidermal adipose connection here that brings cardiometabolic disease uh, together. Uh, Nicole, Ward's group, which, uh, Nicole Ward's group has done more work suggesting that IL-6 is the main mediator of psoriasis form associated with thrombosis. Uh, bringing back genetics into this, uh, Daphne Glabman's group looking at a, um, a, a patient uh, cohort of people with psoriatic disease found that those who had uh, HLA-CW6, uh, they had the highest burden of atherosclerosis. Um, and then finally, uh, there's been initial comparative studies going on now, and these are shown on your slides here. Uh, suggesting that at least you know, cardiometabolic disease seems to be more prevalent in people with psoriasis compared to people with atopic dermatitis. And another study showing people who are admitted for presumably severe atopic dermatitis or, or severe psoriasis, that those who have severe psoriasis tend to have even higher rates of, of uh, mortality in atopic dermatitis. And uh, these are sort of initial sort of comparative studies that we could talk about a little bit more during the talk. <laughs>
All right, so this has led to the fundamental question for our field, which is really psoriasis an elective disease uh, to treat, uh, or is this a disease that 90% you know, of patient population can be untreated, and that's something, something that we should not be uh, concerned about. Uh, and so here, the most robust data, I believe, is an observational research. Uh, large cohorts of studies, predominantly in people with rheumatoid arthritis, but also with psoriasis, showing fairly strong cardioprotective effects uh, on MACE events in people uh, getting TNF inhibitors compared to other strategies. Somewhat similar findings, not as strong in methotrexate, uh, but largely people do think that methotrexate is cardioprotective as well. Uh, so our model has ended up doing a series of uh, rigorous randomized control placebo trials, uh, comparing things like adalimumab or phototherapy compared to placebo, or uh, ustekinumab or secukinumab, or more recently we're launching a study with a premolast to see what these therapies do beyond the skin. Well, they lower the signal in the aorta uh, compared to uh, placebo. Uh, and then we should all be aware in this room about the cardiovascular inflammation reduction uh, trial, the CERT trial being done by Paul Ridker. Uh, this is a large RCT of methotrexate, looking at uh, placebo control, looking at its ability to lower the risk of vascular disease. Not people who have RA or psoriasis, but people who just have a high risk of cardiovascular disease. So this will be the first definitive proof of concept that just uh, suppressing inflammatory activity lowers vascular disease risk, if in fact that's what uh, the study finds. And I think it's will have a paradigm shift for how we think about methotrexate. If it not only could improve your skin and your joints, but lowers your risk of cardiovascular mortality, that would really change the risk-benefit profile of that drug. Uh, so I'm just going to sum up fairly quickly. I, I think in our field, uh, the most prominently associated comorbidities at this point in time are, are cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, of course, psoriatic arthritis, uh, mood conditions, Crohn's disease, and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma of the skin. Uh, and this is work done by Zelma Chiesos in the audience, uh, looking again large population-based data sets, looking at the association of these different conditions. And what she shows is essentially uh, that CTCL, you have a nine-fold higher rate of getting that diagnosis. If essentially you've seen a dermatologist for bad psoriasis and we put on systemic agents of phototherapy. So some of those clinicians we need to be on the, on the lookout for, either for misdiagnosis or progression of disease. There's a lot of emerging work in this field, sleep apnea, NASH, COPD, like how could COPD be related to psoriasis? Well, IL-17 is a master regulator of both of those tissues, so it, it may be uh, more than just um, confounding effects, it may be a, a direct biological link. And I also mentioned that I think, it, despite all the progress we've had in psoriasis comorbidities research, we're still in the infancy also. So we published in a BMJ about three years ago now uh, that if you have um, increasing severity of skin disease, you have an increase in prevalence of moderate to advanced chronic kidney disease. Again, independent of these risk factors, they're more likely to end up going on dialysis. Other investigators have then shown higher rates of renal-related mortality. So this shows you that you know, only in, the, in this decade alone, we're just getting the first studies looking at major associations with major organs like the kidney. Nothing was really done there. So uh, for clinicians, what we should know about is the implications are we need to screen our patients with psoriatic arthritis. We need to determine the impact of their disease and their physical and emotional health. These are things that guide treatment decisions. We need to educate our patients about cardiovascular risk uh, and screen or refer for known risk factors. And when using immune modulating treatment, we should be referring for age-appropriate cancer screening and uh, in instituting age-appropriate vaccination. So like in my own practice, we give the flu shot to our patients. Uh, we actually give pneumonia vaccines to our patients as well, because we're trying to lower the risk of infectious complications. And unfortunately, I was someone was saying we're not doing a great job in this area. This is uh, UK data showing that as the body surface area goes up, the odds of having your blood pressure adequately controlled uh, is going down. Uh, and then more recent work was published a few months ago showing again in UK that when they brought people with psoriasis in uh, from the community, they found that over a third of them had a high risk for cardiovascular disease that they previously did not know about. So there's a lot of under-screening going out there uh, and a lot of under-management cardiovascular risk factors. So we need to do at least what we know works for our patients to achieve better outcomes. And, and that's a lot of information. Uh, conveniently, we have a JAD CME, Junko Takeshi's first author on this, one of our earlier speakers, uh, summarizing virtually everything you need to know about psoriasis and comorbidity uh, in this month's issue. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, my, wet, my left coast person here uh, and give it over to Eric. And, and I think I left you at least, at least 35 seconds. Joel, if he wanted to stand up here together, and he said, I'll stand right behind you like Trump did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak. 
Okay, so my uh, disclosures, I've been a consultant investigator for Regeneron and Sanofi. I'll, I'll mention one slide uh, regarding, their, regarding dupilumab, and I won't be talking about any off-label uses of medications. So just a quick outline, I'll talk about conceptual overview. Joel lent me his slide uh, free of charge, uh, his, uh, his overview of, of comorbidities and, and causal uh, direction. I'll, I'll talk more about atopic march. There's less, there's, you know, less data regarding cardiovascular disease, so I won't focus on that as much. Uh, we'll talk about well-established as well as emerging comorbidities, and then I'll try to sprinkle in some clinical uh, implications along the way. Okay, so this is Joel's slide, uh, but converted atopic dermatitis. So you can think about direct causal relationships with comor comorbid diseases. So for example, in atopic dermatitis, you'd have these environmental and genetic risk factors coming together to uh, give a child with atopic dermatitis with some potentially mediating factors such as disease severity, IgE sensitization, skin barrier dysfunction, Th2 inflammation. And then you can imagine that or picture that going to or leading to comorbid atopic diseases, so for example, asthma or food allergy. Okay, so this sounds good, it sounds clean, however, it's probably not reality, so it, it doesn't happen this way in all patients, uh, and it you know, definitely doesn't happen in this, you know, uh, common atopic march uh, description where eczema starts first, then food allergy, followed by wheeze or asthma and allergic rhinitis later on. So the only way you can kind of dissect what's really happening, what is the true atopic march is kind of looking at cohort studies. So this is uh, Danielle, or uh, this is Danielle Belgrave's work uh, looking at a couple different uh, UK cohorts and trying to figure out, well, what does start first? What are these different uh, trajectories of the atopic march? And so what she actually found using machine learning, Bayesian statistics, is that there's a whole bunch of atopic march, uh, marches. And you can see here that, uh, let's see, where's my, okay. So here's the traditional atopic march. You know, only 3% of patients will go through that traditional where you start with this red line of eczema, followed by asthma, later on by allergic rhinitis. There's a lot of other things that happen. You get eczema only in this, in this uh, latent class. You can get transient wheeze. You can get rhinitis only. Uh, you can get persistent eczema followed by rhinitis. So there's a lots of different atopic trajectories. There's not one true atopic march. So if you try to model atopic dermatitis into one of these kind of accepted models of comorbidity, so there is, it's not really, it doesn't fall into a direct causation model very well, strictly. It's not really associated risk factors that give you that comorbid disease, strictly. So it's more like atopic dermatitis itself, it's more the heterogeneity model of of comorbidity, uh, meaning that risk factors can, uh, you can have the same risk factors for uh, asthma or atopic dermatitis or food allergy. And then I would add a couple arrows to this that you can also have the direct causation, so it's even more heterogeneous uh, than, than these simplified models, of course. So how do, we, how do we study this then? How do we discover new therapeutics, new preventive strategies if things are so heterogene heterogeneic? And so I came across this paper just recently. This was published in the JECI uh, j just uh, maybe this month, last month. And I didn't really know about this group. It's a group called Mechanisms of the Development of Allergy. Uh, and they're trying to, tr trying to study uh, that, that very concept using a, a systems biology approach. So I, I think to answer some of these questions, you know, I just bring this to your attention. I don't understand most of the methodology of systems biology, to be totally honest. Uh, but I think this is what it's going to take. It's going to take integrating multiple birth cohorts it's going to take integrating clinical data, patient data, epidemiological data, omics data to try to figure out what exactly is going on, where do we intervene for patients. Uh, th this group, this European group also consulted with the NIH and a NA, uh, NIAID as well for a discussion of their hypotheses. And I have to admit, it's, it's pretty asthma driven, it's pretty IgE driven, uh, and so some of these findings, I think, I, like I was talking to Dr. Bieber, that as clinicians, we kind of knew a lot of this was, uh, was true, but it's, I think it's exciting research that I think you should follow, and I, I think we need more dermatologists on this, on this list, it's mainly, mainly allergists, uh, so I, I think we can bring something to the table. So here are the main findings of that group. So allergic comorbidity clustered together, we knew that, also called multimorbidity. But they, they did find a novel finding that polysensitization versus monosensitization was very important for predicting that uh, multimorbidity. 
uh, like we dermatologists and allergists uh, who treat eczema know 30, you know, about 38% of the comorbidity that cluster these groups are related to IgE, but IgE is not necessary and it's not the predominant causal mechanism of all these atopic diseases. So we knew that, we knew that from therapeutic data of blocking IgE. The proteonomic uh, uh, networking analyses uh, data look like TH2 signaling is pretty important, especially for these uh, multi-morbidity uh, cases. So in summary, uh, basically causal arrows go, go everywhere, but TH2-driven signals or, and TH2 dysfunction is uh, pretty darn important for, for uh, these diseases that may start at different times. Okay, so let me just finish with one more atopic comorbidity, which is food allergy. So we know that atopic dermatitis is, an, is a really important risk factor for the development of true IgE-mediated uh, placebo uh, oral challenge uh, diagnosed food, food allergy, and Carson Floor has done some nice work and some systematic reviews to show that. Jonathan and I showed that more severe eczema predicts that you're more likely to get food allergy and actually more severe food allergy, so there's this direct relationship between uh, eczema severity and food allergy. But the overall prevalence within uh, children with atopic dermatitis is probably around 15, 16 percent. We don't know what the prevalence of food of true food allergy is in adults with atopic dermatitis. So it's been reported all over the place, between 30 percent, 50 percent. We just did a, a, a clinical sample from five different universities that show uh, it's probably somewhere around 10 percent. There didn't seem to be any increase in prevalence or dramatic increase in prevalence that was statistically significant uh, between mild and moderate to severe in adults. Uh, so, but we need more work on, on the role of food allergy in, in adult atopic dermatitis. One thing that's important to note in terms of uh, causation is that uh, the skin barrier may be a site of IgE sensitization. So there's really nice mouse models. If you put ovalbumin on the back of a mouse, abrade the skin, you get very high IgE uh, uh, production from, from that protein on, through the skin. And you can actually mimic asthma-like phenotypes if you then challenge with that, with that allergen uh, through the respiratory route. Uh, Dr. Hannafin, my mentor, likes to say it's a skin's a high, IG out, high IgE output system. And this has been reported multiple times, multiple different mouse models. Most recently with peanut allergen, you actually don't have to abrade the skin for, uh, to, to get this response. It kind of uh, peanut allergen acts like its own adjuvant. Okay, so is there evidence that this is actually happening in humans? So there's some, it's indirect, but uh, for example, uh, a big predictor of latex allergy is irritant hand eczema, uh, you know, back when latex gloves were more commonly used. Predictor of peanut allergy, IgE mediated, is uh, the use of peanut oil. This is back when there was peanut protein still in peanut oil. There's not anymore, especially not in the United States. Uh, that was some nice work from Gideon Lack, which is most of this work. Uh, environmental levels of peanuts, uh, it, a peanut dust in the environment correlates with food allergy to, to peanut, and filaggra mutations and the presence of atopic dermatitis can intensify that, uh, that effect of environmental peanut exposure. So quick clinical guidance, you have to address it. If, if, if you don't address it and they don't address it, they're still thinking that food allergy is causing their eczema, so you, 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 I recommend addressing it. I say it's associated with the disease, but it's not the cause of the disease. Uh, when, when, when patients bring in these lists of IgEs and unfortunately now IgG testing to food allergy, I say 50% of the American population has a positive test and positive test does not mean allergy. There's been nine randomized controlled trials looking at food restriction in atopic dermatitis. Only one showed benefit and that was basically pa patients who actually had uh, urticarial responses to egg. If they removed egg, their eczema got better. And then, so overall, the evidence of allergen avoidance in terms of food is very weak in my, in my perspective and likely promotes allergy. So why do I say this? Because, because of the data from the LEAP study. So if you expose children early to peanut around uh, uh, four to six months, they have a dramatically reduced uh, uh, type 1 allergy at age 5 to peanut. And so trying to translate this, though, to the population-based level is difficult. Uh, and so this was a night, there's some uh, a food allergy guideline addendum that was just published in the JECI, basically recommending feeding infants who are at high risk peanut early. But I'd say the controversial point is, uh, is whether you need to refer these patients to an allergist for peanut testing prior to exposure. And so there was a really nice JAMA uh, uh, opinion piece 
uh, just published, when they, and, and they brought up some points. How do you define severe eczema? They're worried about uh, moderate or even mild disease, patients with mild disease getting referred allergists for testing. So this is really going to tax the healthcare system, uh, and, and is it really necessary when there's really been no reports that first exposure to peanut or to any food uh, has been related to anaphylaxis uh, in, in less than uh, 12 months uh, of life. Okay, moving on to, to other common uh, associations with atopic dermatitis. So Staphylococcus aureus, uh, as you know, is, uh, colonization infection is a big problem. But even in psoriasis, uh, there's colonization rates that have been published in this meta-analysis between 3 and 64%. Uh, Dr. Silverberg has some nice studies recently published to show that infections in psoriasis are actually more common than we would think, either uh, both cutaneous and non-cutaneous. So pathogenetic mechanisms for infection are both barrier-mediated as well as inflammatory-mediated. I, I don't know which one's uh, more important. And I'm going to skip some of our work. We're looking at barrier dysfunction and staph uh, colonization. And again, I think the take home for, uh, for that story is that it's unclear. We know that patients with staph colonization have more Th2 activity systemically, uh, as you're measured by TARC, and also barrier dysfunction. But we, don't know, but we don't know what's causing staph colonization. Is it the staph colonization driving severity and barrier dysfunction, or is it vice versa? So clinical guidance, antibiotics for uninfected eczema doesn't, uh, doesn't help. That's what the, the systematic reviews uh, confirm. There are, there are, there's pretty good evidence that control of eczema uh, does improve infection rates. Uh, we limit antibiotic use to five days of use. There's some in vitro data to support that but, but re and reducing, uh, um, re re reducing resistance. Consider bleach baths for recurring infections, and then reculture. So Dr. Hannafin showed that you can uh, 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 reverse your uh, MRSA uh, uh, status to MSSA. Okay, so just a couple slides on emerging comorbidities. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, so. <laughs> so. Uh, so we showed that the the, the prevalence of mental health comorbidities. Um, or increase in, in atopic dermatitis. So it, in children, ADHD, anxiety, depression. Uh, Jonathan Silverberg has shown the same thing, and many others have shown the same thing in adults as well. Uh, treatment, it's unclear what the, where the causal direction, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, treatment with uh, dupilumab, for example, uh, this is data from SOLA1 and SOLA2, their phase three trials most recently published, uh, that if you take this subset of patients who have HAD scores, hospital anxiety and depression scale, and if you take the, the subset of patients who qualify for clinical anxiety or depression, and you treat them with this TH2 blockade, you can see that at week 16, uh, up to 30 to 40 percent of them then no longer qualify as having clinical anxiety or depression, uh, statistically significant over placebo. So controlling inflammation, controlling it can have can seemingly have uh, a nice positive effect on mental health comorbidity. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump to the summary slide. So the take home for the next two slides is basically, it's unclear whether cardiovascular risk is increased uh, in atopic dermatitis. It does not appear to be as significant as in psoriasis. And that's two large population-based uh, studies have shown that. And other emerging comorbidities that are uh, somewhat controversial uh, are our obesity, alopecia areata, vitiligo, rheumatoid arthritis, and cancer has been inconsistent. Okay, so these are our combined conclusions. I made them short, and then, jo the, and then Joel made them much longer. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of a simple thinker. He's a complex thinker. So cardiovascular and metabolic disease uh, are well-established comorbidities in psoriasis, but the risk in AD is still being clarified. Cohort studies with measurement of disease severity, confounding, and design elements to address bias may help determine the directionality and causation. Treatment of the inflammatory disease may improve the risk of future comorbidity, but rigorous placebo-controlled RCTs are lacking, except with this guy. And then comparison of disease outcomes in psoriasis and atopic dermatitis should be motivated by gaining a better understanding of the immune pathways but proper control groups and appropriate study design, you know where that came from, analysis and interpretation are necessary to avoid erroneous conclusions. <laughs>
Hey, I'm right on 15 minutes. Uh, more thorough questioning about risk factors for comorbidities and making appropriate referrals is optimal for the total care of your patient. Thank you very much. So maybe we're not going to discuss a little bit for a minute. We're, we're, we are, I guess we have a few minutes for discussion. So, um, you know, Eric, I guess I want to think about some of the paradigms in psoriasis and how you may bring them into atopic dermatitis. So one of our big things has been having combined clinics with rheumatologists. We really recognize that as dermatologists, it can be challenging for us to really identify they truly have PSA. Um, it's hard to definitively make that diagnosis. And then if the case is complicated, we really want that treated by the rheumatologist, even though our, our drugs often work for that disease. In the field of atopic eczema, uh, is it moving that way? Do people work more commonly with allergists and pulmonologists? Yeah, I mean, uh, so there are, there are many kind of centers of excellence. Jonathan has one of the many across Europe uh, that take the, you know, um, that take care of the total patient. I think it's just difficult logistically and financially to, to keep these eczema schools and eczema centers uh, afloat. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 this is, might, may be inappropriate, but I um, uh, talked to Dr. Leung about, you know, what are the key essential things that you would need to make such a center uh, so we can take better care of our patients. He said, if you don't skin prick test, it's, and, and if you don't have an allergist, it's gonna be really hard to keep the whole thing afloat. Uh, and, and not saying that we don't skin prick test our patients, but you know, there's, a, you know, there's complex logistical issues to consider. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what are, the, what are the most important features of those eczema schools that really help the patient, and I think some of that, those studies still need to come. So, but do you think as a dermatologist, the role is to ask patients about their asthma, their asthma control, ask patients about seasonal allergies and hay fever and the control of that, and then refer, or is it, I'm looking at the skin and I'm gonna treat no, that no, and move on? No, no I, no, I agree with you. So I, I think appropriate referrals is really, are, is really important. I think it's a slippery slope, though, when you, if, if we notice these, uh, these comorbidities, uh, and, and, and then what is our role for screening and treatment? So I, I try not to screen patients uh, uh, too aggressively if I'm not willing to address the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if a patient comes in with and, 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 and I know their symptoms of asthma are uncontrolled or they have uh, undiagnosed depression anxiety, I definitely refer to the specialist. And so I would be interested to hear your take. You showed that slide saying that uh, patients or that dermatologists aren't uh, aren't screening or, right, or right. so, so what is the role of the dermatologist and where do you think that line should be drawn? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, to me, I think the, th the secret of caring for the patient is caring for the patient. Uh, and I think in psoriasis, maybe even worse in your field where your patients tend to be younger than ours, so we're probably the only doctor taking care of them. Uh, and they see us as their doctors. So they, they come in assuming that if we don't tell them anything's wrong, they assume everything's fine. And so all the prednisone we have to give them or, uh, you know, uh, potent topical steroids systemically, you know, topically for a long time, they may be getting hypertension of other problems that are commingling uh, why they think they're still relatively young and healthy. So I do think there's an opportunity there for just ensuring the patients are getting this basic routine medical care that they would get ordinarily. The things I think about a little bit uh, also is about the complexity of choosing treatments. And so in psoriatic disease, some of our therapies work for the joints but don't work for the skin. Uh, and sometimes the other way around. And so we often have to be mindful about that when working with our colleagues. Will that play out in a topic term? Will treatments that work for the skin not work for the <laughs> lungs systemically or the other way around? I mean, like some of that networking data I showed you, you know, TH2 is pretty, pretty important. And we know that, for example, dupilumab can treat uh, asthma and atopic dermatitis. So uh, there, there will be some, some added value with, with some of our biologics, but we're still in infancy uh, compared to you guys. So. Great. Great. All right, well, thank you so much for your attention. We'll move on to the next part. It's really my pleasure to introduce the dynamic duo that will speak about <laughs> therapy. For atopic dermatitis, our representative is Thomas Bieber. Professor Bieber serves as chair and director of the Department of Dermatology and Allergy at the University of Bonn. His scientific focus uh, is in the ontogeny and immunobiology of dendritic cells. He's the first describer of IDEX. In fact, he was my role model when I started my uh, footsteps in atopic dermatitis, and I've seen him speak, and I wanted to be like him. <laughs> um, so he had major contributions for um, atopic dermatitis, and I'm delighted to um, have him here. For psoriasis, our speaker is Alexa Kimball, and Alexa has many hats. In addition to being the president of the IPC, Alexa Kimball is also the president and CEO of Harvard Medical Faculty Physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. 
and she's also a professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School. She has received multiple awards for her research in psoriasis and in, in outcomes, and has recently been selected as the recipient of the 2016-17 National Psoriasis Foundation Outstanding a Physician Clinician Award. So. So thank you so much for having us here today. We um, brought our superhero rings <laughs> in our inaugural across the country's uh, presentation here. Um, so uh, by way first, I think we just wanted to uh, show you our disclosures. Both of us have a number of them as well. So I think one of the very interesting questions as we think about psoriasis and atopic dermatitis and the evaluation of how the pathophysiology both is similar and dissimilar in maps across the two, is to now think about what therapies we have, which works for which, and which ones don't. As uh, already alluded to by Joel, things that work for psoriasis don't always work for psoriatic arthritis, and we certainly see that things that work for atopic dermatitis don't necessarily work for psoriasis, but some of them do. And why is that, given uh, the overlap and, again, the separation between uh, the two areas? So we thought we would start with just some classical therapies. And if you think, again, from a very reductionist standpoint, at, at the beginning of all of this, you have epidermal injury and an immune response to it. And so it is interesting even to just think about what is it about that injury that is different, that sets off these different pathways. And of course, in psoriasis, the activation can later on be repressed, but is semi-permanent in many ways. We can obviously control it quite well now with the new therapies we have, but we never really can erase what has already happened. Uh, and I, no doubt you've already seen a brilliant explication by Jim and Emma about the pathophysiology, so I won't go through that. But it is interesting to consider why, again, once you've set up these uh, APC presenting cells that seem to geolocalize to the skin and psoriasis, they sit there. And yet in atopic derm, uh, many of these kids recover and never have it after they reach a certain age. So there's a number of topical anti-inflammatory treatments, of course, for psoriasis that overlap, right? We have steroids, calcineurin inhibitors, coal tar, UV light, and then we have some that do not, which are calcipotriene, which is kind of interesting given the vitamin D uh, role that has been at least explored in atopic derm, um, and then dithranol as well. And I think part of the difference is here, and, and topical steroids are fascinating because they pretty much work for anything, right? Uh, and so there's just such a ubiquitous pathway and such a powerful pathway that knocks things out that it, uh, figuring out where the secret sauce of that is in a way that uh, reduces some of the side effects is still obviously a very desirable goal for all of us. And yet for psoriasis, we remain pretty disappointed, I would say, with the calcineurin inhibitors topically, where we get some positive effects, but not really as much bang for our buck as we need to keep people under control. You can use them of areas of thinner skin with some uh, improvement, but they're just not there. Coal tar, of course, um, and again, when I was in training, which was a while ago, but not that long ago, uh, we were coating people in coal tar and having them sit in our clinics for 40 hours a week. So it is really wonderful to think about the revolution we've seen uh, in topical uh, and treatments there where we don't need to do that for patients much of the time. And then of course UV light ubiquitously seems to help many things except for skin cancer. <laughs> so we have to keep an eye on that. So not a lot of, I would say, recent progress in topicals for psoriasis, a huge amount as we'll talk about in the systemic therapies. Uh, and this leads to the challenge, which I think is similar for both, which is that for our patients with mild or mild to moderate disease, we don't have any, um, we, we haven't gotten to sort of the silver bullet, which is could we get somewhere where we put something on once a day and really keep this under control? I mean, once a week is what I'd really like to see, um, where we would have a more remittive, long-lasting topical effect and not have to have the systemics. Um, in terms of our traditional systemics, we do have quite a number. Again, acetretin and uh, I'm not so sure about fumarates as we don't use them so much in the US, but for atopic derm, we, we certainly would use the others there as well. These uh, traditional therapies typically have a response rate using a PASI 75 of 30 to 50%. Not dissimilar to some of the early biologics that we saw, but certainly outclassed in some ways by the newer therapies we currently have available. And so the value of these, of course, that I've just shown is that we do have a nice, I mean, that's you know, 10 different options for our patients. We can scale them based on the severity that we see, 
and uh, range both dosing and potency in order to get there, and think about the comorbidities of our patients. Uh, but we still have a real challenge for an unmet need, um, although, again, for our more moderate to severe, we have a lot of wonderful options. This group, uh, and as I would posit, probably the atopic derm group uh, across that spectrum still have a number of areas to improve. So, so just to comment, um, because um, I was just thinking about the genetics and, and related to the issue of the barrier function from which we know in this disease it's, uh, it's really an issue. And I'm not sure that this is a secondary issue I think we all agree that the barrier dysfunction in atopic dermatitis is really one of the primary movements of the whole thing. And uh, coming back to the, the initial question of that meeting, is atopic dermatitis and psoriasis one disease or even two parts of the spectrum? I think that we, we learned a lot about the differences between the two diseases, particularly also in terms of barrier function. So clearly, in contrast to the psoriasis, where when you're looking at the normal appearing skin, there is apparently nothing which is happening there in terms of inflammation or uh, disturbance of the barrier function. The situation is completely different in atopic dermatitis. And that's also the reason why, in terms of management and the classical management of this disease, always have to focus on these two particular aspects. That's what I am explaining to my patients every day to really take care about the skin and not only the skin which is involved, the lesional skin, but all the skin from the head to the feet. And this is particularly interesting and important also for the kids uh, while the disease seems to emerge and to develop. And on the other hand, we have the problem of the chronic inflammation. And that's the reason why in terms of advice to the patients classically, we, we always have to focus on these aspects. The emollients, what we call the basic therapy on one hand, and the anti-inflammatory agents on the others. A few words about the, let's say, old-fashioned kind of treatment which are currently experiencing a kind of revival. One, one example is urea. I think everybody has used urea in any kind of emollient mixture, and recently it has been shown that this molecule seems to be far more active than we initially thought in terms of, uh, let's say, hydration. In fact, these authors have shown in a GID paper some years ago that, in fact, urea is able to induce on one hand or to increase in one hand, on one hand the expression of filigree and other molecules which are key for the barrier function. And on the other hand, interestingly enough, urea is also able to increase the production of antimicrobial peptides, which we know are quite reduced in the skin of these individuals. Another example is coltar, very old-fashioned treatment. And recently it has been shown that in fact coltar is binding in the skin to the so-called AHR, which is a kind of xenobiotic receptor, which is inducing a lot of different kind of signals. The good news with coltar is that at least in atopic dermatitis, again, this kind of molecule is able to modulate the expression of epidermal proteins, including filigree and others. And on the other hand, it seems to be a little bit um, anti-inflammatory in that it is decreasing spongiosis and other mechanisms. So you see, these are two typical examples of what we call old-fashioned topical treatment from which we now learn that they are probably doing much more than we expected initially. And in terms of treatment specifically um, focusing on the inflammation, I think we are still limited in our uh, ability to really control the disease. We have two main family of, of, of components, topical steroids and the TCIs. Both have advantages and, um, and disadvantages. We are all facing the issue of corticophobia. We are also in the last years increasingly facing the issue of pimecrotacrophobia. And this does really not uh, facilitate our management of the patients. A few words about the UV light. I've seen many discussions about UV light, especially in the, the discussions we had in the IEC, whether we should place UVB narrow band treatment somewhere in the middle between topical steroids or topical treatment overall and systemic treatment. I see the UV light treatment a little bit different. I think it's a kind of add-on that we provide, or I personally provide to my patients, particularly in the winter time, 
We don't need UV light treatment in the summertime, but many patients, in fact, need some kind of UV light in the winter type. And this also, as we know, is increasing a lot of things in the skin. It has an antipyretic e effect. It is increasing, of course, vitamin D3 synthesis, and it has also some antibacterial properties. So in other words, I think the UV light has a, ve a very important a stand in our, in our management of these patients, and we need this particularly in the winter time. With regard to the systemic treatment, we are not so lucky as you guys in the psoriasis field. Unfortunately, the, the huge story which starts, I think it was in 2005, with the first uh, anti-TNF alpha agents is just about to starting now. Um, uh, I think we, we may hear in the next days or weeks the, the, the approval of the FDA for dupilumab uh, for the treatment of these patients. But so far, and this is just for the US, we are not about having the, 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 the approval in Europe yet. But so far, how did we handle these patients? How did we manage these with the more severe forms? And interestingly, the situation was very delicate because at least in Europe, we, we have at some countries in Europe, not in all, we have an approval for cyclosporine A. So cyclosporine A by essence is in fact the first line systemic treatment that we are applying to our patients. And if it fails or the patients have side effects, kidney toxicity, blood pressure issues, or we are going outside of the one year or two years maximal treatment that we just allows, then we have to have plan B anyway. And the plan B usually are other kinds of immunosuppressive drugs like azathioprine, methotrexate, and MMF. Don't try to use anti-TNF-alpha or something similar in atopic dermatitis. Despite some very restricted reports and single cases, it doesn't work. And surprisingly enough, omalizumab anti-IG doesn't work either. Why it is so, we don't know. We would expect that for a disease which is somehow related to IgE synthesis and IgE-mediated um, allergy, it should work. But it definitely does not work. Whether this is an issue of concentration, of doses, or of heterogeneity of the disease, we don't know finally. And I would just add, I think, uh, one of the issues for topical therapy is that the psoriasis patients tolerate more irritation than the atopic derm. And I think that's why some of the things like dithronol and other things might work, except yeah. they, it can't, you can't manage through that. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the pathogenesis, and again, not to be uh, too redundant, <coughs> but to point out that at least in psoriasis, we have um, developed a much more sophisticated map. Uh, it's interesting if I go back to my slides from 2000 of what I was presenting, it was actually an inverted diagram. So uh, a lot of research has been done uh, that has really brought this out. And it's clear from this that TNF plays an expansive role. Uh, and again, that's part of the reason why it's sort of surprising in some ways that it has no effect, except that it indicates the pathways really do have to be different. But IL-17 seems to have a very interesting and specific role for the mucosa in the skin um, as part of those defense systems. And again, when you think about where we need the mo most robust initial immune response, it would be the lungs, the gut, and the skin. Uh, there's some paradoxes between the gut and the skin, I think, that are emerging as well. But we even see in our topical therapies that there is an impact on those IL-17 pathways, uh, in addition to, of course, the new biologic pathways that we have that are quite targeted. So what a wonderful era, right? Again, back in, I started using TNF agents in psoriasis back in 1998 when they had first started to be approved and I was at NIH and we could kind of mess around with things there. Um, and we weren't doing it right. It really took the rigorous clinical controlled trials to get the right dosing, um, which I think is a, just a critical uh, lesson that we've already addressed, but as we move these fields forward. But you look at where we were, which was a 49% PASI 75, and now we are in an era where we have therapies that are routinely getting two-thirds of our patients to that point. Now again, some of these target pathways that have multiple effects, and what the hope is, is of course, is that we can move into pathways that target even more effectively, but have fewer other side effects to other parts of the system. And again, I think that's why IL-17 inhibition is so appealing. And certainly as we look at 
uh, the three molecules that are currently either approved or uh, in development, uh, you can see that we're getting now rates 75, 80 percent, and people, again, have moved to this entirely new benchmark that was sort of unconceivable at the beginning of a PASI 90 improvement and a PASI 100 improvement. Another important feature, though, about these is that they do seem to be uh, more durable, perhaps, than the TNF inhibition. And that's a really, I think that comes back to the pathways as we think about them, that where you have multiple effects, you also have the ability to have redundant pathways that are compensatory, in addition to the immunogenicity, which seems to play some role, but maybe not a huge one for many patients, uh, there does seem to be more loss of persistence um, with some of the TNFs than with some of these newer classes of agents. And that is a very hopeful place for us. And even if you look at the Eustachinumab data, you can see from the registries the persistence of that drug is better in how patients use it in the real world um, than some of the other agents. So again, sort of step by step, we're tackling the needs. Uh, and uh, what is coming down the pike next, of course, is incredibly exciting, which are the P19 antibodies, which are affecting IL-23, but not IL-12. And there are two or three of them. There's actually more recent data that just came out in JAD from the phase three programs with guselcomab, for example. Um, Tildrakizumab is another. Um, and so we are going to see um, that in rizikizumab. Uh, tremendous data coming out over the next couple years. So every time I think that we're done in psoriasis, we turn another corner. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this will happen for atopic derm. I'm also very optimistic about the data that's emerging and where it's taking and allowing for not just therapies, but really refined approaches. Yeah, as I mentioned, we, we are not so lucky as you are. Um, yes. We are just at the beginning of the <laughs> <Yeah>. whole story. <laughs> But the story must start somewhere, and, and, and the starting point of the story is, is a very classical, old-fashioned, I would say, TH1, TH2 paradigm, which um, was uh, described many, many years ago. But this paradigm changed. As you heard from um, Dr. Emma Goodman this morning, um, we, we, are, we have switched in our mind the understanding of this disease uh, from a classically uh, local inflammation to a more systemic inflammation, to a, from a TH1, TH2 paradigm to a TH2, TH22 paradigm. And this shows you just a, a cartoon from a recent um, uh, review work from Stefan Weidinger and Natalia Novak from my department. And, and, and this highlights again the role of these two kind of, of cells, of TH2 type of cells, or T2 type of cells as we call them now, and TH22. And of course these presumably key cytokines are the primary targets for any kind of approach uh, trying to, 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 let's say, to neutralize this kind of situation. And as we know, as an example here, uh, because it has been mentioned so many times, uh, the, this uh, new kind of approach, which is uh, the blocking IL-4 and IL-13, by the way, blocking two, anti two um, cytokines by um, in fact, inhibiting their binding to one single chain, which is the alpha chain of the I4 receptor, you may really be able to, to have an impact on that particular disease, but not only on atopic dermatitis, but also on asthma and rhinitis in polyposis nazi, maybe in other kind of T2 related diseases like the um, EUAE or uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, or even on fibrotic diseases, since we know that a lot of fibrotic diseases seem to be driven by T2-like kind of profile. So when it comes to test this hypothesis in clinical trials, and, and let's just show you one slide from the most recent paper uh, published from the, the phase three trials, the SOLO1 and SOLO2, you see here that in fact, we, we, we really have a breakthrough here in, in terms of controlling this disease on the, on the long run um, but the most important thing is we can even reach a status of our patients, patients which are clear or almost clear. The very famous IgA001 that you are facing in the clinical trials for psoriasis and we as, as well for atopic dermatitis, although it's not validated, nobody knows exactly what it means. But anyway, <laughs> as long as you have score rather easy and you can correlate this to something that we understand, it's a good news. And in fact, finally, I think it's evident that um, this kind of approach is extremely promising. And I'm still waiting for the long control disease uh, 
uh, con lung control of the disease because um, I always mention, this is my favorite um, sentence, anybody can treat the flare, but the most challenging aspect is to control the disease on the long run. And with that kind of compounds in our hand in the future, we will probably be in a much better shape to, to control the disease on the long run and potentially also to have an impact on the comorbidities. The problem that we are currently um, facing, and you heard this from Dr. Goodman this morning, is that we have more and more evidence that we are all speaking about atopic dermatitis as a single disease, but the evidence currently is going just in the other direction. If you look at the heterogeneity of the clinical phenotype of that particular disease, you will not be surprised to see that most probably if you look at the natural history of each individual patient, the age of onset, the severity issue, and many, many other aspects, you have to assume that you are facing a very complex disease, which probably also is underlined by different kind of mechanisms. So in other words, the TH2, TH22 cytokine paradigm may be just valid for a subgroup of these patients. We are learning more and more that probably in the Asian population and the studies which have been run here and shown by Emma Gutmann are, have been done in, in Korea and Japan. I'm very curious to see what happens in China because in fact this is a, a huge country and, and I've seen a lot of patients with this disease there. And nobody knows exactly what happens in these particular individuals. The ethnic aspect of this disease is of increasing importance and will probably also impact drug development programs, including, of course, the use of targeted therapy with the, the kind of uh, approach like dupilumab. All right, so we've had a great presentation on comorbidities, so we'll just mention very briefly um, just a few things to think about. Um, and I think one of the questions is, is there actually a parallel to uh, the atopic marks that we see in psoriasis as well? Um, we do have some data to suggest that, in fact, comorbidities accumulate over time and that they accumulate fairly quickly. Uh, so it's just sort of an interesting paradigm, I think, to start to get our heads around uh, and makes us think about what are our prevention programs and our therapeutic manage management of them. And of course, psoriatic arthritis, I think, remains a bit of a conundrum as we think about, it, again, how it is both similar and disparate as well. Um, and this just demonstrates, again, where we see differences in the arthritis and other, but also cardiovascular disease becomes an interesting area to look at which therapies actually have an effect uh, that's beneficial, that's demonstrated. And I would say the data for TNF inhibition has become increasingly robust. I'm not quite sure it's tipped into a, a true positive yet, but it is accumulating that direction. And yet some of the others, um, again, remain uncertain. Uh, so I'll turn here. Yeah, the, the other aspect uh, which has been mentioned in, in detail this morning by, uh, by Eric is the issue of the atopic march. And he has nicely shown that there is no one single atopic march, but probably in numerous kinds of trajectories of that particular um, kind of, of, of comorbidities. But the key point is that we learn from all these kind of investigations that most probably, and that's my, my assumption is, that in fact the starting point lies somewhere in the skin. So if you see a small um, child, a newborn, which starts the disease, at least it, that's my behavior in face of the parents, I try to convince them that at that time point when the disease starts and there is no evidence for anything in terms of IgE sensitization, that's the right point to make a kind of very early intervention to the first inflammatory lesion in order to control the whole thing, hoping that in fact we will be able to control the atopic march. You heard this morning that you can intervene very early in terms of, of using very simple measures, like for example using emollients. There are a couple of studies which have been published where, which are showing a huge difference between those kids who have the highest risk to develop atopic dermatitis, whether or not they have been treated with emollients for a period of six months. Whether this has an impact for a longer period of time, as mentioned by Eric this morning, we don't know. My biggest question is I would be very happy to have some kind of biomarkers which would predict which, which child 
is really having a benefit of this kind of very simple measurements. But the fact is, it is possible when we are focusing on the early intervention to have an impact on the disease itself. And, and now, I would say like Martin Luther King, I have a dream. My dream is that by using these new kind of compounds like dupilumab and others, from which you suspect that they are really targeting key molecules, not only key molecules for the inflammatory reaction, but also key molecules implicated in the IgE sensitization process, which most probably starts in the skin. So my guess is beyond treating the patients with the ongoing uh, uh, disease, my guess is the highest potential of these molecules is to use them very early in order to stop the whole thing, to stop the progression of the disease, to stop the chronic inflammation, and to stop the atopic march. And even more, we cannot exclude that we cannot only stop the atopic march, but we could eventually also reverse the atopic march. When you look at the patients who have both disease, asthma and atopic dermatitis, this would be something very important. So my, my statement at the end is like your president. Um, <laughs> let's make therapy of atopic dermatitis great again. <laughs> So we have to the concluding slide. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you know, and I would just say, I think, I can't top that, so I just really should stop. Um, but I would just say, I think one of the most fascinating things as you think about our therapies, uh, especially as these new targeted therapies are developed, is they have taught us a lot about the disease, right? I think the paradigm of bench to bedside has in many ways just been upended. It's when we take these into patients and our clinical observation of what's happening and what those differences are have dramatically informed our scientific understanding. And of course, the best part is making the patients better. Uh, and so I look forward to you know, our continued improvements. So. Yeah, and this slide just shows you in the green those few compounds or treatments which are common to both diseases. Yeah. And you immediately realize, in fact, that there are, of course, some kind of common treatments, but most of the others we are really effective, in fact, are different. And this brings me to the final point, which has been mentioned this morning. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from a genetist that, in fact, what we know since 40 years, that atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two completely different diseases, has now been confirmed by the genetics. Uh, I remind you to um, maybe know him still, Professor Adolf Christophers from Kiel, who was the at least the German Pope of uh, psoriasis uh, 30, 40 years ago, he always mentioned in his lectures, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two completely different diseases. And he would also say, and for me, they are mutually exclusive. And to be honest, in my 35 years of dermatology career, I think I've seen only two or three patients who have the same disease on the same time. Terrific. So thank you very much thank for you. your attention. Appreciate it. So we will next move to our pediatric portion of the program, uh, which I think is just a fascinating area because, of course, as we treat these children, the risk-benefit ratios are, are somewhat different. You have young immune systems, young children, years of treatment. You also want to avoid stigma and other experiences that are so important from a formative standpoint and all the march that we've talked about. So Amy Pallard needs very little introduction, but she's the president and founder of the IEC and chair of dermatology and professor of pediatrics at Northwestern. And then Kelly Cordura, who's an associate professor of dermatology at UCSF. So thank you all. We're going to go as quickly as we can <laughs> and try to do this jointly. Okay. All right. So we have a few disclosures. And the first thing that we want to emphasize is that children are not just little adults. They have very different clinical features to start with. Uh, diagnosis with atopic dermatitis is largely clinical and certainly more straightforward than much psoriasis in children. Now, we do see some dis differences in distribution. In the young child, of course, that diaper area tends to be spared. There's more on the cheek, the chin, and the trunk, and more exudation. 
Uh, and as we see older children and adolescents, we start to see more of that periorbital, perioral, neck flexural, hand and foot involvement, more lichenification, more chronicity. And of course, we know that in either case, environmental influences make a big effect, whether we're talking about saliva or food or friction, but there are maybe inherent differences in the skin at different sites, at different ages, and that remains to be determined. Now, when it comes to psoriasis, when a patient presents with pink or red plaques with silvery white scale, as in the photos here, it's a very easy diagnosis to make in children. However, psoriasis is often misdiagnosed in kids because of atypical features and distribution. So many children will get scalp involvement, and occasionally, in 5% of cases, just face involvement, or patients may show um, initially with scalp and face, which can overlap a bit with atopic dermatitis in that regard. Kids less than two most frequently present with diaper psoriasis, and this is what distinguishes uh, very young children uh, with psoriasis from atopic dermatitis, which typically spares the diaper area. However, this can be very confusing um, and uh, confused with other diaper rashes in children, again leading to this misdiagnosis of pediatric psoriasis. Now, when uh, pediatric patients present with gut tape disease, it's a very straightforward diagnosis to make. Fascinating is that the appearance can often overlap with atopic dermatitis. So you can see the patient here, that's Amy's patient, who has features of both psoriasis and eczematous dermatitis. And in fact, in one series, only 9% of kids were correctly diagnosed who had psoriasis because of some of these overlapping features. Children who have a, a past medical history devoid of atopy or who have a family history of psoriasis are much more likely to hold a diagnosis of psoriasis. And certainly those with early scalp and diaper involvement are clues to a diagnosis of psoriasis versus atopic dermatitis. This is a patient I just saw in clinic last week and through the slides here. Uh, in these, uh, this is to show that yes, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis can coexist, a very interesting story in an adolescent. She has very clear ichthyosis vulgaris and patches of asteotonic eczema, which may not be projecting perfectly. Um, I followed her for years for her ichthyosis vulgaris. In the context of a recent strep pharyngeal infection, she came in with very typical um, thin plaque psoriasis lesions on her upper thigh, as you can see in the lower photo. So sometimes we'll call this psoriasiform eczema or eczematous psoriasis. Now moving on to uh, the epidemiology, we heard already about the increase that we're seeing in atopic dermatitis, and in fact that's been particularly in industrialized countries and has paralleled the increase in asthma and allergic rhinitis and food allergies. Uh, it's thought to be associated with urban exposure and that has led to hypotheses like the improved hygiene and less exposure to antigenic stimuli as being causative and perhaps changes in the microbiota which are receiving more attention. Uh, in terms of psoriasis, the U.S. annual incidence, as you heard earlier, um, has doubled from 1970 to 2000. Excellent work done by Mega Tollefson and colleagues at Mayo showed us or, or thought uh, that some of these increases might be related to psychosocial stress in modern society, the obesity epidemic that we're seeing in children, and certainly more two-parent working households, which puts more kids in daycare and perhaps increases kids to infectious triggers. We already saw this picture showing the disease severity of atopic dermatitis, reminding you that in childhood, actually, a small group is severe, but that that percentage increases as these children get older, and especially after three years of age. Now, there are very limited data on disease severity in pediatric psoriasis, and you heard a beautiful exposition of why that might be. Uh, definitions vary. Uh, measures for severity in kids aren't really standardized. PASI is typically used in studies, but in the clinical realm, uh, we don't use PASI. Uh, there are a few registries that seem to suggest that mild disease is most common in pediatric psoriasis, but this is certainly site, physician, and setting dependent. I looked at my data over a 10-year period, and only 50, or 51% of my patients were mild, and 49% were moderate to severe. We need more work in this area. Now we can move on to ask about the immune pathways, and here again, we don't have very much information in the pediatric population. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to get biopsies, particularly for younger children. But some work that uh, Emma Gutman and I have collaboratively done over the last few years has actually looked at young children under the age of five with atopic dermatitis who've had their onset 
in the previous six months, so early AD, uh, and in this case, using quantitative real-time PCR, we've shown strong TH2 skewing in the skin as is seen in adults. And you can see here uh, your red bars representing lesional skin, your pink bars representing non-lesional skin. And as you look across at IL-13 and IL-5 and IL-31, you can see that as in adults, children in their lesional skin have very high levels of these cytokines, but I want to also point out that in non-lesional skin, these are sky high and actually significantly higher than what we see in the non-lesional skin in affected adults. Uh, I'm happy to show you some very preliminary data that my colleague, a dermato immunologist at UCSF, Mike Rosenblum, and I put together. Uh, it took about a year to get 12 children to let us biopsy their skin. It's very difficult to get um, immunophenotyping done on pediatric psoriasis for obvious reasons. Uh, some of our preliminary data in this study, and these were all confirmed, clinical confirmed as psoriasis patients, we found, uh, as you can see in the green bars and the two left lower graphs, a decreased expression of IL-17 um, positive T cells compared to adult psoriasis, which is in the red graph, and these were uh, uh, significant findings, uh, and an increased expression of IL-22 T cells compared to adult psoriasis in the uh, green versus red bars, which is very fascinating given uh, the commonality of overlap in kids with atopic derm and psoriasis in the strong TH22 pattern in atopic derm. So we need to do more work to try to confirm these findings, but very interesting early data. Now, if we switch to blood, uh, we can look at the blood phenotype in early pediatric versus adult AD. And here, very interestingly, we see a difference. We see that only the Th2 CLA positive, CD4 positive T cells are increased in the children as, uh, and you can see that um, as well in the adults, but not, as you see here, the CLA negative IL-13 positive or the uh, IL-22 uh, IL positive or the CD8 positive or the HLA positive or chronic T cells. All of these are increased in adults but not seen in the blood of children. Now, I didn't show you, but there is an increase in the skin of early childhood AD of your IL-22 as well, but none of these are seen in the blood. Now, there is a marked reduction in blood of the interferon gamma CLA positive. Again, CLA positive are your skin homing cells, CD4 positive cells in children. And as you can see circled in red, we only see that in the most severe adult patients with atopic dermatitis. Now, hot off the press, I'm going to show you in just a minute uh, some proteomic data. But let me just tell you that older children are now being investigated for these possibilities because I think one of the important things to recognize is this difference in the blood may present to us a window of opportunity. And just as you just heard from Thomas Bieber, his dream, well, we share that dream because maybe this is telling us even more so that there is this window during which time, if we jump in and treat more aggressively to suppress the TH22 axis, we may be able to prevent the development of other forms of atopy. And by looking at older children and filling in that spectrum, we may be able to address that more fully. Now, I've been talking here um, about in skin, uh, the mRNA expression in, in blood flow studies. I want to just give you a little clue that, that uh, proteomic as assessment tells us there is indeed increased Th2 uh, in the blood in terms of protein. And Patrick Bruner will be presenting this at the IEC symposium at the SID. I want to encourage all of you to come to that on Friday at noon there to hear some of this data. I also want to mention Th17 briefly because he's also found that in the blood. Uh, and this is a difference that I'll show you in a minute when we talk a little bit about infection. But children, in general, have higher levels in their uh, skin of Th17 pathway. Uh, and this is certainly seen in the children of atopic dermatitis. Uh, and here you can see, as opposed to adults with atopic dermatitis who may show evidence of, of other markers in their blood, TH17 is not increased in adults, but here it is in children. And that's another difference that we need to keep in mind. Now, when we move on to comorbidities, 
In atopic dermatitis, of course, we know all about the atopic disorders. And again, we may be getting some clues from our immunophenotyping studies that tell us more about this as we, in the future. And we also know about the infections, the high risk of Staph aureus and uh, more disseminated herpes and molluscum, um, as well as infections at other sites, perhaps. I just wanted to show you uh, another bit of data looking at cathelicidin in the skin of children at this early period of time and emphasize that this long-held concept of adults not being able to mount this uh, antimicrobial peptide response, again, shown here. But if you look at the children uh, at the left of the slide, you can see that indeed they mount a response. And this again tells you about this Th17 axis in children. Healthy children, much more of a response as well. But we see an increase in children with atopic dermatitis. And not that suppression that we see in, in adults with atopic dermatitis as opposed to psoriasis. So this needs more research, but it suggests that early on children have a much brisker antimicrobial uh, response. We'll also uh, talk in a minute about neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, let's look at the comorbidities of pediatric patients with psoriasis. We've enjoyed having some data to actually review and discuss for years. We were reading all about adult uh, psoriatic patients, and now uh, data are emerging at a rapid pace. Psoriatic arthritis was one of the first known, rec uh, first recognized comorbidities of pediatric psoriasis, and certainly kids do get uh, psoriatic arthritis. It's at a much slower and lower rate than it is in adults, and we seem to have a greater rate in the United States than uh, is observed in Europe. Let's look a little, a little closer at obesity. So studies showing a, an association with obesity and pediatric psoriasis absolutely span the globe. From the very first study um, as part of the Atanercep double-blind trial back in 2008, uh, in that cohort of patients with moderate to severe disease, 37% were found to have um, uh, obesity. Uh, in Italy in 2009, almost 50% of patients with a spectrum anywhere from mild to severe psoriasis were overweight versus 27% of controls. Uh, in Germany in 2010 and more recently in 2015, we've seen several fold increases in components of the metabolic syndrome in addition to obesity. Uh, a large Kaiser Permanente database in Southern California found overweight and obesity increased the odds of psoriasis in that group, and that independent of body mass index, there was an increase in lipids in that pediatric uh, group, and that psoriasis was uh, much more severe in the patients who were more obese. Um, in China, we're seeing the same. 25% of patients were overweight or obese versus 12% of controls. And again, looking at my own unpublished data as a, a comparator reference, in my moderate to severe uh, patient uh, population, psoriasis was much more severe in the obese patients. The most important study that's really uh, been published, though, uh, in the last decade has been this international study that was uh, published in 2013. Amy was the lead uh, investigator. This was a, a global study that involved 409 patients from nine countries. And in summary, this study showed that globally, the odds of obesity and increased waist circumference were higher in all psoriasis patients. And the more severe the psoriasis, the more obese the patients were, including central adiposity, which puts uh, a patient at increased risk for metabolic and cardiovascular disease. And this was a really important study because uh, measures of adiposity included not just body mass index, which is most common, but also waist circumference and waist to height ratio, which are surrogates for visceral adiposity and maybe more sensitive indicators of metabolic disease and cardiovascular risks in kids than is BMI. And so in summary of the aggregate data, adiposity is increased among pediatric psoriasis patients. The obesity association in kids has been found to be strong, global. It's most pronounced, however, in the United States, particularly that central obesity. Um, and the risk of obesity is proportional to the severity of psoriasis. A really interesting sub-analysis from the international study uh, published by Becker et al. in JAMA Derm showed that high adiposity, either kids that were overweight or obese, for whom um, uh, growth chart records were available from their pediatricians, showed that high adiposity preceded the psoriasis by up to two years and 93%. And this really underscores a role for early intervention.
Uh, and so it, it, there's been a lot of talk about marches this morning. So cardiovascular, is there a psoriatic march in kids? So um, we've talked about the association with obesity components of the metabolic syndrome. Even abnormal lipid function has been recently identified in pediatric patients. And so the question really is, is can chronic systemic low-grade inflammation in childhood result in cardiovascular disease in early adulthood that Joel and others have identified? And what is the relative contribution from obesity versus inflammation? And will reducing psoriasis severity and weight or both reduce the risk? And my dream is that we have sensitive biomarkers at some point to identify those children at greatest risk. We'll just say a word about the possibility of metabolic disease in atopic dermatitis children and, and doing a comparison here. And there's certainly been some evidence presented in adults. Uh, and in fact, uh, Jonathan Silverberg's work doing a meta-analysis of 30 studies that included both adults and children, so it showed an increased odds of overweight and or obesity in North America and Asia, but interestingly, not in Europe. Uh, in addition, a caregiver report of weight and height from the National Survey of Children's Health has shown an increased odds of obesity overall and in moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And case control of doctor-diagnosed moderate to severe atopic dermatitis has shown an increased odds ratio for obesity, a higher waist circumference, and increased systolic blood pressure. So you may ask, well, gosh, we've seen many children with psoriasis who clearly are overweight or obese, but we don't really think about that much with atopic dermatitis. And that was certainly a question I had. And possibly that relates to the fact that when we're looking at the absolute BMI percentile, it's much higher in psoriasis versus atopic dermatitis. So we just really may not be noticing it in our population. And I will add that uh, there is now data showing more sedentary behavior, more TV time, more video games in children with atopic dermatitis, and this may be exacerbating their cardiovascular risk. Now, moving on to quality of life and neuropsychiatric comorbidities, it's well known that both children with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis have a poorer quality of life than even children with epilepsy or enuresis or diabetes. And with atopic dermatitis, and particularly we think about some neuropsychiatric issues that have been shown to be increased. These include depression, anxiety, conduct disorder, and autism, but perhaps the greatest attention has been paid to the increased risk of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this has been shown to have the strongest association if more severe atopic dermatitis and poor sleep, and usually this association is with the earlier onset atopic dermatitis, and uh, that's been associated with a medication requirement uh, to combat attention deficit disorder. Uh, similarly, psoriasis has been associated with um, increased uh, depression scores, anxiety. These children have social isolation. There's also an association with bipolar disease. And importantly, it's um, talking to John Koo at my institution, who's a psychiatrist and an, a psoriasis expert, the inflammatory profile in psoriasis is very similar to the inflammatory profile in the brain of patients who have organic depression. So very interesting uh, parallels and not just a downstream effect of psoriasis. Importantly is quality of life. Uh, uh, Alexa and others have done incredible work showing impact on quality of life of patients, but Mega Tollefson and her group at Mayo just uh, uh, published a beautiful paper talking about the quality of life in caregivers of psoriasis and how significantly impacted caregivers' life is in multiple domains. So therapy, our final domain here, um, and there are shared pediatric responses to topical therapies. We think about nonspecific, anti-inflammatory, topical steroids, and certainly we use that for both, although more potent steroids are required for treating psoriasis versus atopic dermatitis. We can think about calcineurin inhibitors. We use those extensively in children on, on the face, but they don't work that well for psoriasis um, on non-facial areas, but can for atopic dermatitis. Mm -hmm. We've used tar and uh, anthralin, things like that. Um, and they can be effective for both disorders. Salicylic acid we use for lichenification in atopic dermatitis and seems to be tolerated well. Uh, we can think about PDE4 inhibitors, um, chrysoboral for atopic dermatitis. Could that be effective for psoriasis? Well, there have been some studies that remains to be seen. But we do know that there are some differences. For example, uh, we can use retinoids, 
We can use vitamin D3 um, in psoriasis, but they would be very poorly tolerated for atopic dermatitis. Now, when we think about the question of well, what are we most commonly using as far as systemic agents for atopic dermatitis, we have the TREAT survey initially performed in Europe and then in the United States. And when we look at the TREAT survey in Europe, we see that the first line choices are primarily cyclosporin, but followed by oral steroids and then azathioprine. In the TREAT survey in the United States and Canada, we again see cyclosporin in the lead as first line agent, at least to start with. Uh, but then methotrexate and mycophenolate mofetil as the other choices in the United States. In both of these surveys, the concerns, side effect profiles, and the perceived risk of long-term toxicity. And I can't emphasize enough how many children who probably could benefit greatly from systemic intervention have not been treated because of these fears about side effect risk. Now, that means that the experience in children has largely been based on case series and anecdotal use. There have not been large placebo-controlled or comparative trials of any of these agents for atopic dermatitis, and there are no data yet on any targeted biologics in children. Now, what about pediatric psoriasis? So our research investigator, uh, psoriasis investigator group, uh, did a study, a survey, very almost exactly like the TREAT study for atopic dermatitis, and it's called CAP, as you can see here. And among all of the results, I wanted to share with you um, the first line choice as selected by respondents to the survey for moderate to severe psoriasis. 60% listed that phototherapy would be their first line choice. 35% uh, listed systemic therapy in the order that you see here, methotrexate, much uh, greater than cyclosporin, much greater than oral retinoids. And then biologic therapy was cited by only 5% of respondents as being a first line choice for moderate to severe psoriasis. And interestingly, the exact same reservations were cited as a concern about using side of, um, systemic therapy, which was that the side effect profiles and perceived risks of long-term toxicity are great. Now, there's overlap um, uh, in systemic therapy for atopic derm and psoriasis, and those drugs here that have an asterisk beside them are used for both, uh, which leaves us with very uh, few others that are only listed for psori uh, used for psoriasis. Now, we do have one randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, thanks to Amy and the Atanercept study, and now finally, my birthday was in November, but my, big, my, my biggest birthday present was when Etanercept got FDA approved by the FDA on November 6th, which was fabulous because prior to that, we had nothing for pediatric psoriasis that was on label. Thanks to many of you in this room, the IEC, the IPC, and other people um, who have advocated, pediatric patients are now involved much earlier in systemic therapy trials. Um, you want... You want to summarize this, sure. or I'm happy oh, to? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, this is a study, uh, really, again, that was spearheaded by Amy in this country and Inga Bronkers uh, outside of the U.S., which was a, a really nice international retrospective chart review of what are we doing? What are pediatric dermatologists doing for uh, pediatric psoriasis? There were 10 U.S. sites, 10 European sites, for almost 450 children were included. Phototherapy was used in 19% of those patients, and as the only agent ever used in 13%. Um, and here's the systemic breakdown. So and of the remaining, the remaining 390 children that used a systemic therapy, methotrexate was the most common, used in almost 70% of patients. And biologics were a very uh, distant second, but of all of the biologics, etanercept was the most commonly prescribed, and others such as retinoids, fumaric acid in Europe um, were also used. Uh, Let's see. I want to just tell you an interesting um, folic acid story that came from this study, um, that the scheduling of folic acid has something to do with the GI adverse effects of methotrexate. So um, in North America, we primarily dose folic acid six or seven times a week, um, which actually resulted in fewer GI adverse events than weekly dosing, which is the primary European uh, schedule, regardless of the total weekly dose of methotrexate. Oh, excuse me, of uh, folic acid and methotrexate, actually. Um, other, other results that were interesting to note here is that um, the high, there was a much higher risk of having at least one related, drug-related adverse event, GI adverse event, or labs with methotrexate versus the TNF inhibitors. But there was actually a lower risk of documented infections in the methotrexate group versus the TNF group, but these were mild, um, uh, insignificant infections that did not necessitate treatment discontinuation. 
The most common adverse event with TNF inhibitors, as could be expected, was injection site reaction. And importantly, no patients in any subgroup developed TB or malignancy. Oops. Um, I'll quickly just mention that TNF inhibitors have the most data for pediatric psoriasis. A, a, the randomized controlled trial and an extend, a five-year open-label extension of that showed the efficacy and safety of a Tanercept with really only one serious infection and no malignancy or deaths. It's recently been showed that standard dose adalimumab is superior to low-dose methotrexate with comparable adverse events. Um, and there, some of the newer biologic therapies, we really don't have a lot of data for um, pediatric patients. However, I mentioned here ustekinumab that has shown some early success for atopic derm, as you heard about earlier. And finally, these are the drug approvals that are available or that are um, in the United States and Europe. So Enbrel was approved in 2009 in Europe uh, for age 8 and above, which has now been reduced to age 6 and above. We have it now in the United States approved for patients aged 4 and above. Humira and Ustekinumab both approved in Europe in 2015 for age 4 and 12, respectively. And most importantly, which is really good as a pediatric dermatologist to recognize that ongoing, or for anybody that takes care of kids, that we have kids in trials now. So there's ongoing studies in the U.S. of the PDE4 inhibitor, Apremolast, for patients aged six and above, and upcoming ustekinumab and uh, ixekizumab trials as well. So anticipation for the future with respect to therapy, the need is great, no doubt, for both topical and systemic options for children with psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, but ideally we want therapeutics that are pathogenesis-based, and that's going to require a better understanding of the pathogenesis and the course of pediatric psoriasis and atopic dermatitis in children of different ages and how that compares to adults. Several medications may be effective for both diseases based on some shared pathogenesis and mechanism of suppression of inflammation. Maybe some of the PDE4 inhibitors, the JAK inhibitors that are coming up. But that immunomodulators targeting TH2 pathway activation show promise for adult AD, and our phenotyping in children would suggest at all ages, possibly in preventing the atopic march and targeted immunomodulators towards the THMDNIL23 pathway activation are moving towards pediatric use for psoriasis, and we'll have to see if there's going to be any benefit as well in atopic dermatitis. When we think about the role of IL-22, IL-22 antagonist therapy in pediatric psoriasis, I think given what we just heard a little inkling of from, from Emma today, we need to think about this as well for atopic dermatitis. And Kelly and I can't stress enough the need for a prospective registry for children, incredibly great if it could be a shared database among all these systemic medications and uh, maybe even something to look at atopic dermatitis <laughs> and psoriasis together. So that's one of our dreams yes. for the future. And with that, thank you, yes. thank you for, for your, your attention. attention. <laughs> On the behalf of the IEC and the IPC, there are four groups that I'd like to thank here today. Uh, the first is I want to thank our sponsors, which include Celgene, Leo Pharma, Sanofi Genzyme, and Regeneron for helping support such an incredible uh, group of people who came together for this event. Uh, the second is I would, um, of course, like to uh, thank our speakers who spent their time preparing, getting here early to be a part of this. If you could also stay after for a few minutes, we'd like to capture a quick photo of the group to commemorate the event. Um, then our staff who've worked so hard to put this all together, Margaret Young, Laura Gartner, Joelle Vanderwalt, and Amanda Bledsoe. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you. Um, it is so important that we bring together groups of people and integrate this information across our field to solve these really complicated and important problems and share our collective wisdom in a way that is so powerful. Please fill out your evaluation forms. We look forward to other sessions like this, building upon this information in the future, and enjoy the rest of your meeting. Thank you.